welcome uh, to our Cape Breton Regional Municipality Council meeting for Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021. Uh, I will begin this evening by asking Angela, please, to call the roll. Present. Present. Here. 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 Thank you, Angela. Uh, we will now not sing, but stand for the playing of O Canada. <laughs> Thank you. I will now uh, ask Councillor James Edwards to read two separate memorials this evening for our moment of silent reflection. Thank you, Mayor McDougall. It's, it's my sad but distinct privilege to recognize and pay tribute to two giants from the Glace Bay uh, CBRM healthcare community who recently passed away. Kay McGinnis, RN, uh, passed away on February 1st, 2021, and Dr. Bob O'Brien on March 2nd, 21. Kay McGinnis came to Glace Bay from Rose Blanche, Newfoundland in 1949 and attended Morrison Glace Bay High School. She would graduate from the Glace Bay General Hospital School of Nursing in 1955 and began a 36-year career in pediatrics and later as a nursing supervisor. Her kind and caring personality, along with her terrific wit, made Kay a friend to all. She went above and beyond to help her patients and their families and was a friend and mentor to generations of nurses, doctors, medical staff, and to all those she met while patrolling the halls of the old general. And her community service did not end at the hospital. For decades, Kay was also a Eucharistic minister and lay reader at St. Mary's Church. She would quip in reference to her nursing and ministerial roles that she saw them, quote, coming and going. She leaves behind her husband, Joe, sons, Bill, Joe, Tim, and Glenn, brother, Brent Burton, seven grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren. It was said in Glace Bay that if Kay McGinnis didn't know you, you weren't born. <laughs> I, for one, am very proud to, be, to have called her my friend. She will be sadly missed by all who knew and loved her. Dr. Brian Bob O'Brien graduated as a medical doctor from University College of Dublin Medical School in 1969. He went to South Bend, Indiana, where he completed his residency in family practice. Deciding to specialize further, he returned to Ireland and to specialize in obstetrics and gynecology, gaining membership of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Great Britain and Ireland. Bob came to Cape Breton for a sixth for six months in 1977 and fell in love with both the place and its hospitable people and never left. 
Bob worked both as an obstetrician and gynecologist and as a family doctor with a huge practice of over 3,000 patients. He retired from obstetrics with a closure of the obstetrical unit in Glace Bay in 2014, but continued in family practice right up to the day of his sudden death and untimely, the day of his, of his sudden and time, untimely death on March the 2nd. An avid sailor, he and his wife Teresa crossed the Atlantic in their sailboat Tahara with a berth at the Royal Cape Breton Yacht Club where he later became Commodore. He was a competitive racer, winning many a race in Cape Breton waters, including the Royal Cape Breton Yacht Club Regatta, which he was instrumental in starting. He and Teresa also inaugurated the junior sailing program at the Royal Cape Breton Yacht Club and crossed the Atlantic in 1984 as part of the Tall Ships Race, leaving Sydney on board the schooner Sorsha Bria. Dr. O'Brien will be remembered by his patients for his kindness, compassion, and, com and competence. He will be remembered by the nursing staff for the unfailing respect with which he treated patients and staff alike, and by his medical colleagues for his reassuring presence in the case room. His unfailing willingness to answer calls for help at any time of the day or night and his warm Irish wit. Recognizing his over 33, 43 year of dedicated service to the community of Clays Bay, Reserve Mines, and surrounding areas, we would like to offer sincere condolences to his wife, Teresa, his children, Dr. Sean O'Brien, and Dr. Cleona O'Brien, MD. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. And for all those who are able, please join me in standing for a moment of silent reflection. Uh. Thank you. Before we move to the approval of the agenda, uh, I just have two notes. So when we do, uh, when we are engaging in voting or asking to speak, we have a little bit more space between us this evening, respecting social distancing. Uh, and I have eyes that are only progressively getting worse. So if you do want to speak, uh, if I could ask my colleagues to please raise your hand until I acknowledge you, that would be of great help. The second note before we approve the agenda is uh, a note that we are going to be removing item 6.1, the second and final reading public hearing of the tow truck licensing bylaw. Um, Sir, Staff Sergeant Gil Boone is here should anybody have any questions, but for the time being, this matter does require additional public consultation uh, with the various tow truck companies, so we're going to allow uh, some time for that to take place in a more meaningful manner. If anybody does have any questions, like I said, Staff Sergeant Gil Boone is here. Seeing none, uh, we can now move on to the approval of the agenda. So move, Madam Mayor. Okay, moved by Councillor Green. Second. Seconded by Councillor Steve Parsons. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Question. Question has, um, has been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Motion is carried. Thank you. Now we'll move to item two on the agenda, proclamations and resolutions. Uh, item 2.1, Purple Day for ep Epilepsy. I would like to welcome Councillor Darren Brookschweiger, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, CBRM proclamation, Purple Day for Epilepsy. Uh, be it therefore resolved that CBRM Mayor Amanda M. McDougall and Council proclaim March 26, 2021 as Purple Day in the Cape Breton Regional Municipality in an effort to raise epilepsy awareness. And I so move, Madam Mayor. Moved by Councillor Brookschweiger. Second. Second. Seconded by uh, Deputy Mayor Erlene McMullen. If I Councilor? can continue, thank you, Madam Please. Mayor. Whereas Purple Day is a global effort dedicated to promoting epilepsy awareness in countries around the world, and whereas Purple Day was founded in 2008 by Cassidy Megan, a nine-year-old girl from Nova Scotia, who wanted people to know that if you have epilepsy, you are not alone. And whereas epilepsy is one of the most common neurological conditions estimated to affect more than 50 million people worldwide and more than 300,000 people here in Canada. And whereas the public is often unable to recognize the common seizure types 
or how to respond with appropriate first aid. And whereas Purple Day will be celebrated on March 26th annually to increase understanding, reduce stigma, and improve the quality of life for people with ep epilepsy throughout the country and globally. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Question. Questions been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Motion is carried. Uh, item 2.2, Cape Breton Highlanders Memorial Way, and I will welcome Councillor Cyril McDonald. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, resolution, Cape Breton Highlanders request to designate Route 223, Leeches Creek to Wicogama Bay, Cape Breton Highlanders Memorial Way. Be it therefore resolved that CBRM Mayor Amanda M. McDougall and Council request staff to write a letter to the Honorable Lloyd Hines, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal, asking for their support for the members of the Cape Breton Highlanders proposal to designate Route 223 as Cape Breton Highlanders Memorial Way. I so move, Madam Mayor. Second. Moved by Councillor Cyril McDonald, seconded by Councillor Steve Gillespie. Councillor? If, if I may, thank you, Madam Mayor. Whereas the roots of the Cape Breton Highlanders Regiment were formed in 1871 in Bedeck, Nova Scotia, and at that time deemed by many to be the only true high, Highland Battalion in Canada, given that over 80% spoke Gaelic fluently, with majority having immigrated to Canada from Scotland, thus marking 2021 as the 150th year of its inception. And whereas the Cape Breton Highlanders went to serve our country in both the First and Second World War, and while others transferred to units who served in the Korean War, and most recently assisted in Afghanistan, not to mention that original members from pre-World War I were mobilized locally to provide guard for the coal mines, the Sydney Steel Plant, and the Marconi Tower at Tablehead. And whereas the Cape Breton Highlanders is a primary reserve infantry regiment of the Canadian Armed Forces, rich in history of their Highlander descendants, and still holds true to their Scottish traditions through their dress uniforms with kilts and their team approach to mission success. And if I may, Madam Mayor, uh, any of my uh, residents that are uh, sitting at home wondering what this means for Route 223, uh, this has no impact on addresses or the actual uh, naming of the road. It simply is a, is a memorial similar to what we've seen on, uh, as Peacekeeper's Way and so on. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Is there any further discussion? Question. Question has been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Thank you, Councillor. Motion is carried. Next, we will move to item 2.3, paid sick days. Uh, I will hand this over to Councillor Gordon McDonald. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, be it therefore resolved that the Mayor Amanda McDoug and McDougall and Council request staff to write a letter to the Premier of Nova Scotia, the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education, and all CBRM MLAs providing our support to updating the Labour Standards Code to enshrine tense paid sick days in the next legislative session. And if I may, Madam Mayor. And whereas paid sick days are a critical part of preventing the spread of COVID-19 and other illnesses, making it a good public health policy that should be available permanently, as we work to minimize future waves and outbreaks, paid sick days will be an important tool. And whereas paid sick days would be a beneficial to workers in pub public facing service roles, it is important that workers stay home when they are ill. However, low income workers can rarely spare those wages. And whereas people with 10 or more paid sick days per year are more likely to use preventive health services, reducing long term health care costs. And whereas the Nova Scotia government should update the Labour Standards Code in the next session to enshrine 10 paid sick days. And I saw a move, Madam Mayor. Moved by Councillor Gordon McDonald. Second. Oh, seconded by Councillor Lauren Green. Any discussion on the motion? Councillor James Edwards, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, offer uh, some comments on this particular um, resolution, if I may. First, I'd like to uh, commend my a uh, learned colleague for such a noble initiative in that uh, who wouldn't want to have uh, paid sick time. Uh, however, there is a, a practical side of the discussion that needs to be explored as well. 
uh, in my uh, previous life as a uh, CRA payroll auditor, uh, I attended uh, businesses on a regular basis where the business uh, establishment was having difficulty uh, paying their uh, pay employee deductions, and uh, they were often faced with the um, dilemma whether or not to pay the staff or pay CRA. So, you know, whether it was slow cash flow for uh, slow account receivables or uh, what have you. So, uh, when, when I saw this uh, uh, resolution, I took the uh, time to uh, check with a couple of uh, uh, local uh, businessmen uh, who are friends, uh, one with uh, several employees, another with uh, uh, just over 100. And the first question, the uh, employer uh, who I asked, uh, who I brought this to was, uh, who pays? Now that sounds like perhaps a rhetorical uh, question, but when you explore it a little further, uh, you think, uh, um, you know, like not unlike uh, unemployment insurance where, or uh, pardon me, employment insurance, uh, where there's uh, tax deductions or deductions from uh, uh, payroll for the employee. Uh, that, that's something that would have to be established. Uh, you know, the I guess the initial response would be, well, the employer pays. So uh, that would have to be uh, looked at uh, further. Um, the uh, second uh, employer I, uh, I spoke to uh, thought that uh, the timing of it uh, with the in the COVID uh, uh, world was uh, um, uh, poor on our part to uh, uh, try to. Um, uh, make this uh, resolution. Um, actually, and there, there was a third em employer I spoke to as well, and uh, um, this person uh, was open and closed all last year because of uh, COVID, uh, lost 97% uh, uh, decrease in revenue, and uh, if it wasn't for the federal wage subsidy, uh, they were closed. So, you know, that there's, there's those types of examples that have to... Uh, uh, be explored. So, uh, to do a, uh, a calculation on the uh, on, on the paid sick days using the uh, numbers um, that were presented, the fifteen dollars an hour and the like. So, for a, a five-day week, we would be asking the employer to pay an additional six hundred dollars plus uh, employer portion, CPP, and EI. And uh, so it wouldn't take uh, too long for that to add up $1,200 for the 10 days. If the uh, employer had 10 em such employees, then you're looking at an additional $12,000 per year for that uh, uh, one employee. Um, uh, again, uh, it, it is a, a noble idea. So I checked with the, uh, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, who represent uh, some 110,000 members uh, in every industry across the country. And uh, if, I, if I may, I'm, perhaps I'm running short on time, uh, Madam Mayor, but uh, I'll, I'll skim through this. It's uh, written by the president of the CFIB, Dan Kelly. And uh, he says, while CFIB recognizes and supports the need for many special measures to respond to the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, including paid sick time, there are serious concerns that need to be fully considered prior to any introduction of permanent <coughs> paid sick time provisions. He goes on to say uh, exactly what uh, my employer friend said, who will cover the cost and how society will ensure sick time is used appropriately. Small firms are already bracing for a significant increase in employment insurance premiums to cover the cost of the higher levels of the of, of the 30 seconds. Pay no, you have 30 seconds. Go 30 ahead. seconds, yeah. thank you. So uh, small business owners just cannot be expected to take on any additional costs at this time. The CFIB urges federal and provincial governments and all parties to ensure that we do not make COVID-19 related response measures permanent until we return to normal times and debate both the intended and unintended consequences. And again, uh, that's written by Dan Kelly, the president of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. So I just wanted those uh, considerations. Uh, that's time, Councillor. Thank, Thank you. you. Was there any further discussion? Councillor Erlene McMullen. Or Deputy Mayor, my apologies. No worries. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, although my, my, I'm not nearly as uh, read and prepared um, 
in what I'm about to say, but I, to I, I truly believe in the idea of sick days, and I do, I would love to see that it is instowed and ensured that everyone does have the ability for sick days. That said, there is a lot of information still out there, and obviously some things that have to be looked into, but to remove all that in my personal feeling, I, as a councillor, I have been approached on this by a few residents, um, including local business, small in particular. Um, I was also by residents themselves who also would like to see sick days, but they also have a concern that municipally they just asked, and I, I did say I would address it, so municipally they do ask that we don't Right now, this is a specific ask. Whether it can, It's currently being brought forward by a political party outside of our municipality. So the concern of this resident, I do understand, is that if we start supporting specific things being brought to the legislature by various parties, that we're starting to become partisan. So that is a concern of mine, especially, I mean, people know my background. I have, so I, I am apprehensive there, but I did promise her that I would bring that forward. So. Based on that, um, would I like to see it continue to be looked into? Absolutely. Would I support it being looked into? Would I support sick days in general if it can all work out? Absolutely. But currently, to be so specific at this particular time, unfortunately, as a counselor, not personally, but as a counselor, I, I, I will have to, you know, um, I'm unable to support it, I guess is the best way to put it. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, next, we have... Councillor Gordon McDonald, followed by Councillor Steve Parsons. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, I'd just I'd like to point out to uh, in a couple of uh, uh, comments that were made by my, my fellow councillor um, regarding who pays. Uh, well, who pays? Uh, the employer pays. The employer pays whenever there's a person sick in their business and they carry that illness into their shop, and then there's others that have to leave that shop and, and, and go home. Um, you know, so, so they pay there, and so, and once it's been proven, uh, this paid sick leave, haven't paid sick leave, it's been proven that uh, people that have those in place don't necessarily take and use them uh, just because it, they're there. They like to keep them and save them for times when they are sick and it's necessary for them to be able to use them should something happen at home. Uh, and usually it's the lower income workers that don't have these, those same paid sick leave benefits and, you know, they really can't afford to be home. And you know, it, and it also got, has to do around you know what COVID has talked about. You, you mentioned COVID. Uh, uh, it's not a time to bring it up. Well, COVID is the time to bring it up because it's COVID that really spear spearheaded this initiative, and not just here in Nova Scotia, but there's other provinces right across this country that are taking this on. We have doctors right here in Nova Scotia that are making presentations all across the Maritimes uh, regarding paid sick leave. Uh, I sent you some of the presentations. I sent you them some of the facts and myths around the pay paid sick leave. And you know, and, and those are real and, and uh, things that are have been uh, researched and investigated by in, in many capacities. And, and I'd also like to point out that the CFIB is an entity that is paid for by businesses uh, to to fight off kind of initiatives like this and to keep uh, workers down and, and 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 not be able to to, to gain the, the rights and benefits that workers should have across the country. And you know, so you know, I, I personally don't put a lot of stock in the CFIB for those reasons. But I mean, you know, everybody in this room, practically everybody in this room, uh, has the benefit of paid sick leave. You know, when we, when we go home sick, well, we're paid. And I mean, why, why, why can we have it? And why can all, all members of government have it? But yet people that work in low income, in frontline work, can't be afforded the, the benefit to be able to have your province legislate this kind of an initiative into their labor standards codes, you know, to, to make those uh, people be able to be afford to be able to stay home, to go, be able to afford to look after their kids. And these are the kind of initiatives uh, as a progressive municipality that we should be looking toward. And you know, it's, it's, this is not about a political kick. This is about, this is about looking after our, our weakest members of our society and, and municipalities across this, province, across this country are taking on these initiatives right now. And, and we don't want to be left out or we shouldn't be left out. And I encourage you all to reconsider any doubt you have in what this, this initiative and this resolution is going to do. It's basically asking our government to take steps forward to make, take care of our, 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 our less fortunate and people that don't have the benefits to a paid sick leave ability. And I mean, if we, can, if we can start there just by encouraging our government to do it, we're not writing a law here in this room. We're just going to ask the government to support this initiative. So I encourage you all, uh, brothers and sisters, to <laughs> fellow councillors, I guess, and uh, you know, to, and to be able to look at this initiative 
as, as something that's positive and, and not for, not for, it's not going to take away the, uh, the rights of the employer. Imagine someone in a food care industry and someone coming in coughing and spitting in their food in the back kitchen all day instead of being homesick because they can't afford it. I'd much rather them homesick. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next, Councillor Steve Parsons. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Uh, conceptually, I, I certainly agree with the philosophy of paid sick time for employees. When I look at small businesses in Canada, like any country, small business makes up a very large portion of our, of our employment today. Uh, and the old adage of if employers are hit with extra taxes or extra, extra uh, receivables, then of course they along, pass that along to the consumer, ideally. That's the only way they can afford to, to, to take these benefits on. Uh, as far as 10 days, I don't know. I, I, I haven't seen the numbers. I haven't seen the formulas of how this would impact on a business with 10 employees versus 20 employees. M small business in Canada today go up to hundreds of employees. So uh, without that pertinent information and without the, the provinces, uh, uh, you know, we, we deferred it to get some uh, information back from the provincial departments, Nova Scotia Federation of Labor, which I haven't heard any feedback from. So I don't know how we can define it and make a true decision without understanding it truly, what impact this would have on a lot of businesses in our community that employs a lot of people. So at this time, I, I, will, I will be deferring it and not voting against it, not in principle, but conceptually, I don't have the proper information to make that uh, determination. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I had Councillor Darren Brookschweiger, then we'll go to Councillor James. James, you were first, sorry. No, no Kenny, James spoke. Sorry, yeah. my apologies. That's okay. Jeez. So, okay. <laughs> Councillor Kenny Tracy, then we'll go to Councillor Brookschweiger, and then Councillor Edwards. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I can certainly understand where Councillor McDonald is coming from, but speaking with uh, some of the business people in my area of town, uh, basically when I brought it up, it was like, well, hold on one second here. I'll go get you the keys to the business now because if that happens, I can't see us hanging around much longer. So uh, for me, uh, I really get where Councillor McDonald's coming from, but I have to take into consideration uh, the business people that I've talked to in town, and uh, for their, those reasons, uh, I'll find it tough to uh, support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Darren Brookschweiger. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think the issue is at this level of government with this here kind of a resolution that's put before us, um, we don't have the details that we need as a council. Um, I do know I was a small businessman and I know what this could have meant for me with my 13 employees I had working at once with three different businesses and I know it could have been very hard. We had some uh, some lean years, and I remember James Edwards visiting me, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, with that said, Madam Mayor, I think uh, the issue here is uh, the provincial government are in charge of this legislation, and it would be my hope that they would do the proper research that's needed to make a decision. I know that Cape Breton is made up of a lot of small businesses. We're mainly small business. Uh, we have a lot of franchise businesses in CBRM uh, who look at populations and uh, 100,000 is one of their main things that they look at before they come to the community. So we just went below that. So as they look at all the reasons if they should stay or if they should leave, I think this would be something they'd look at as well because it's not uh, in many provinces in the country. I think it's two or three other provinces where this is actually taking place. But I would hope that the province, I understand it's the workers, and on behalf of the businesses of Nova Scotia. So I won't be supporting them, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. On your second opportunity, Councillor James Edwards. Thank you, Mayor McDougall. Uh, the only other uh, point, I, I, I ran out of time with my initial uh, uh, reaction there, but um, it, the, the three employers who I spoke with, and, and uh, all said that uh, in a small business environment, a lot of times the uh, employer is very uh, receptive to uh, helping uh, the, a, a sick employee uh, regardless. So, you know, it's not that the, uh, I'm sure there are situations where employees uh, don't get paid for extended periods of time, but uh, um, 
the, they would normally uh, uh, grant some days uh, paid sick time, uh, um, but even though they aren't uh, mandated. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Is there any further? Oh, Councillor Glenn Perouche. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I do agree that uh, the heart's in the right place and that we do have to do more in relation to paid six day, sick days. But uh, as Councillor Tracy alluded to, there's a lot of mom and pop stores out there that are barely hanging on before COVID with the way things are going, the convenience stores, small businesses. So. I just, uh, I just feel it's unfortunate for us to try and make such a such a decision, even to support a letter. So, unfortunately, I won't be able to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. We have Councillor Lauren Green next, followed by Councillor Eldon McDonald. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just, uh, just before I get into some of the facts, because uh, I was one of the individuals at the last uh, um, go around for this particular. Uh, resolution that uh, I indicated I needed some more information. More information was provided and I have gone through it uh, diligently and uh, I want to read some things that were uh, that were out, that stood out to me. The most recent data available available revealed that 58 percent of workers in Canada and over 70 percent of those workers make less than twenty five thousand dollars a year having no access to paid sick leave. COVID-19 the pandemic has exposed the urgency to address the gap in paid sick leaves as a matter of health equity. Low wages, racialized major minorities, and racialized workers who are more, li more likely to be not denied paid sick leave have faced higher rates of COVID-19. The workplace is a precarious, with precarious jobs and lack of paid sick leave have become hotspots for COVID-19 infection transmission including outbreaks in long-term health home health care, farming, meat processing plants, grocery stores, and warehouse. In fact, as of December, 20, December 4th, 2020, 30% of the active cases of COVID-19 outbreak in Ontario were workplace related. Without, without, uh, workers without paid sick days are 1.5 times more likely to go to work with contagious illness. Canadian research shows that workers in high-risk settings, food handling, long, tear, long care, and child care will continue to work with illness and cannot afford to take the time off, creating the need, to creating the existence of the third phase of the pandemic. Um, so I will be supporting it. I, I know uh, councillors are afraid that, you know, we're, we're setting some kind of precedent or um, we're actually cutting legislation here. We're not actually doing that. What we're asking the provincial government to do is to look at this. Um, Councillor Parson raised a good um, question there when he said, you know, perhaps the 10 days may be the issue. Um, so should we be looking at 10 days? And maybe um, for the mover of the resolution, perhaps we can move that, remove the 10 days and just put in that it's paid sick leave that we're looking for the provincial government to explore in their labor standards. So I'm just wondering not for the mover of that, if we, if we remove the, paid, the 10 paid sick days and just say paid sick leave, um, it may be a little more palatable for councillors that are sitting around the table that it would be addressed at a different level. So I don't know if the movers are uh, prepared to do that, but I am prepared to support this resolution. I think it's a, a good thing. And uh, I think about the, uh, you know, the people that are in the jobs that we, we consider to be frontline. Those are the people that are gonna continue this pandemic and it's gonna be continued to pass on because they cannot afford to stay home. So I will be supporting the resolution. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Eldon McDonald. very much, Madam Mayor. Uh, just a couple of comments, I guess, and uh, following up on Councillor Green's comments, uh, exactly what I was going to propose. Um, it seems we're hung up on the enshrinement of 10 days. Um, I think in principle, uh, you know, the, the argument around it is a good argument. Uh, so I appreciate the Councillor bringing it forward. I uh, read through the additional information that, that uh, Councillor McDonald provided and it was helpful. Uh, but as we've seen and, and heard here tonight, there's other issues to be looked at. So I think in, 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 in following up on you know, what we're asking the provincial government to do or senior levels of government to look at, we're actually 
in my opinion, not asking them to look at this issue. We're asking them to enshrine 10 days. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's not looking at anything. That's basically telling them we want 10 days put in this legislation. So I think maybe there's an opportunity for some consultation and some, some working with the businesses and the different uh, government levels that could look at this. But um, I think the pandemic has proven that there is issues with people coming to work sick. Uh, I think it's somewhat fair to say that we've seen a winter that has almost had zero flu going around. So we're, we're pretty sure that masks are working and, and the way we, we are functioning has been a benefit. So uh, I think probably production for businesses have been up probably this year for, for most people not being off sick. So uh, I think there's opportunities there for a, a discussion to happen. But I definitely think that there's value in having paid six days as a 10. Uh, the council that brought this forward very much, uh, I think, may have mentioned tonight, but in the information speaks to five days, three days. Uh, the numbers seem to circle around that, so I don't know why why this is 10. Uh, but if most people only use three to five, then maybe there's there's more of a, a, a palatable, uh, palatable uh, solution to come forward on those numbers as opposed to 10. So I, I would recommend the same thing as Council Green has put forward. Uh, maybe we look at removing those numbers and look at the, the opportunity to advance the this uh, forward in having more of a negotiation consultation process and that the government undertake those uh, directions. I don't know if, if Councillor McDonald could speak to that or not. If, if we... Correct. Councillor McDonald. <coughs> Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, the reason the 10 paid sick leave is in there is just it's a number that, that was put there um, simply because it gives a person 10, as 10 days works out to be a two week period to be to be sick and recover from that illness. But again, this is just a, a request to the province. And, and basically, when they go look at the, at the numbers and they do their own studies, they're, 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 they're going to look at what the facts are with the three to five days that most people would use. Um, you know, but, you know, if, if I thought, if, if I thought uh, this would pass by me amending the, the resolution, and I'm not convinced that it would, it would pass by some of the, the comments that I heard around the table around paid sick leaves in general, but you know, if I, th if I thought for sure it would pass so that we wouldn't look like we don't want to support paid sick leave for workers, I'd certainly amend it to, to remove the, the enshrined 10 paid sick days, you know, and, and to go with just uh, paid sick days in legislation. You know, that, that, that would work, but, um, you know, um, so let's give it a try. So can I make an amendment, Madam Mayor? Certainly. Uh, to to uh, have the bigot therefore resolved uh, state that, that Mayor Amanda M. M. McDougall and Council request staff to write a letter to the Premier of Nova Scotia, the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education, and all CBRN MLAs providing air support to update the later code to, to uh, enshrine paid sick days in the next legislative session. Does, I'll second. Does the sec, uh, we would require the previous seconder to agree? No. no? Sorry, my, my apologies. So the amendment was moved by Councillor Gordon McDonald, seconded by Councillor Cyril McDonald. Is there any further mo discussion on that motion to amend? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor of the amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. 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 Okay, we're gonna go around the table. Starting with District 1, Councillor <coughs> Gordon McDonald. Aye. District, District 2, Deputy Mayor Early McMullen. Nay. District 3, Councillor Cyril McDonald. Yes. District 4, Councillor Steve Gillespie. Yes. District 5, Councillor Eldon McDonald. Yes. District 6, Councillor Glenn Perouche. Nay. District 7, Councillor Steve Parsons. Nay. District 8, Councillor James Edwards. Nay. District 9, Councillor Kenny Tracy. Nay. District 10, Councillor Darren Brookschweiger. Nay. District 11, Councillor Darren O'Quinn. Yes. District 12, uh, Councillor Lauren Green. Aye. And myself, nay. So the amendment has been defeated. So we'll go back to the motion that's on the floor. That is to accept the be it therefore resolved as it stood with the enshrining 10 days. All those 
or is there any further discussion on that motion? Question. Questions been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. 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 Okay. <laughs> We're going to go around the table again. District 1, Councillor Gordon McDonald. Aye. District 2, Deputy Mayor Erlene McMullen. Nay. District 3, Councillor Cyril McDonald. Nay. District 4, Councillor Steve Gillespie. Nay. District 5, Councillor Eldon McDonald. Nay. District 6, Councillor Glenn Perouche. Nay. District 7, Councillor Steve Parsons. Nay. District 8, Councillor James Edwards. Nay. District 9, Councillor Kenny Tracy. Nay. District 10, Councillor Darren Brookschweiger. Nay. District 11, Councillor uh, Darren O'Quinn. Yes. District 12, Councillor Lauren Green. Aye. And myself, nay. Motion has been defeated. Okay. Thank you, Councillor, and thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll now move to item three on our agenda, which is delegations. So this evening we have uh, several presentations. We're going to begin this evening by the Collaborative Environmental Planning Initiative, also known as CEPI. Uh, I will welcome Ron Newcomb. We're also going to have Paul Schwartz join us from Pituba. And uh, I will remind our presenters tonight, we do have 15 minutes al allocated for each presenter. Uh, if you have more than one person, you can you can divvy it up. But 15 minutes is your presentation time, and then we go into discussion of questions and and uh, answers. So, Ron, I will hand this to you. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Your Worship, for the opportunity to come and talk to you today. Um, the Cape Breton Regional Municipality is one of the founding members of the Collaborative Environmental Planning Initiative. And we want to say we've appreciated so much your support over the years. But we know that with progress comes new faces to the table. So uh, we're happy to have this opportunity to uh, reintroduce uh, ourselves. And my name is Ron Newcomb. I'm the assistant coordinator of the, of the CEPI. So uh, let's see if I can get this to work. The, uh, the CEPI grew out of a desire for uh, a management plan for the Bordeaux Lakes. And it was a long, uh, it is a long history to develop that. There's a, a few steps along the way that have happened. This is a, an illustration or a picture here of Escazoni back in the 1970s, the oyster farm uh, that existed back then. The decline of the, uh, the sudden decline of the oyster industry in the Bordeaux Lakes was one of the many impetuses for uh, developing protections and looking at the environment of the Bordeaux Lakes. Um, in, uh, there were other steps along the way. In the early 90s, there was the development of the Escazoni Fish and Wildlife uh, Commission. In 1999, the establishment of the Unamagi Institute of Natural Resources. And in the 90s, a series of conferences and workshops began where people were getting together and talking about these issues that face the Bordeaux Lakes. But finally, in uh, 2003, was a, quite a landmark moment because it was the first time that First Nations chiefs sat down with senior members of government to discuss these issues and start formulating a plan. And if we look, um, this is just a picture of that conference that took place in Wapmacook. And also conferences, workshops were held with non-government stakeholders as well. But finally, in 2005, the Collaborative Environmental Planning Initiative for the Bordeaux Lakes was born. And the CEPI is a table where all levels of government sit together to work together on a common goal of protecting the Bordeaux Lakes and creating sustainable development there. So that means that all First Nations chiefs, mayors, wardens, uh, ministers provincially, and the federal regional directors general all sit together at this table and uh, talk about their common interests. It's a unique organization. It's certainly unique in Canada, uh, unique in North America, and some have suggested, uh, like Senator Dan Christmas, that it is possibly the only one in existence in the world, uh, the only table where all levels of government sit down and work together. 
uh, on this next slide, you can see the Bredore Lakes Charter that was signed then in uh, 2005. And at that time, Mayor John Morgan was representing the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. The way the CEPI is organized is all these uh, First Nations chiefs, mayors, wardens, provincial ministers, federal regional directors general uh, make up the CEPI. They are CEPI, and they form what we call the senior council. But the on-the-ground operation of CEPI is conducted by a management committee, uh, which has representatives from all the senior council members at that table, and it is selected by the senior council. Um, this management committee is chaired by Senator Dan Christmas and also Victoria Councillor Paul McNeil. And it is advised by a steering committee where all stakeholders of the Bordeaux Lakes get to sit at a table and bring issues forth. And it is also advised by an elder committee led by uh, Dr. Albert Marshall and a youth council as well. Um, the, uh, during the process of the CEPI's work, various task teams, project uh, groups, uh, and so on are created as needed to accomplish uh, projects and, and so on to support the work. On a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the, there's only two employees actually of CEPI. Um, uh, the coordinator for CEPI is Stan Johnson, who's sitting over there by the uh, curtain, and myself, I'm Stan's assistant. This next slide just shows uh, some, just a small portion of some of the projects that CEPI has helped to uh, not only create, but support and, and uh, happen along the way. Now in 2011, uh, the committee that was helping to develop the management plan for the Bordeaux Lakes produced this document, The Spirit of the Lake Speaks. Again, a unique concept in all of Canada. Uh, the Spirit of the Lake Speaks is a management plan, but it's written as if the lake is speaking to the stakeholders. And it's different from a management plan that most people would like to see with rules and regulations because it recognizes that the Bordeaux Lakes is a dynamic and changing ecosystem. And there is no one person or body that uh, has uh, authority over the Bordeaux Lakes to make rules and decisions. But rather, many people have a, a stake in there and, and also have jurisdiction. So the Spirit of the Lake Speaks management plan process helps people to collaborate. It provides a table where all of these people, all of these government levels can come together and collaborate uh, about uh, making decisions about how the Bordeaux Lakes will be managed and how sustainable development will take place. Uh, it's done through a collaborative process using seven guiding principles and also the concept of two-eyed seeing. And if you're not familiar with that, in its very basic terms, it makes sure that uh, Traditional Mi'kmaq knowledge and Western science are both looked at whenever making management decisions for the, uh, for the uh, Bordeaux Lakes and the watershed. Um, since that time, uh, we know that other developments have taken place in the Bordeaux Lakes. You're no doubt aware of the Bordeaux Lakes biosphere, the UNESCO uh, site. Uh, in 2016, CEPI sponsored a sustainable development conference for the Bordeaux Lakes. And you can see six uh, pillars of industry that were highlighted at that conference, that came out of that conference, areas where development can take place in the lakes, but it was discussed how these things could be done sustainably. And also um, the uh, blue, the David Suzuki Foundation Blue Dot Movement was highlighted at that conference and uh, has since been brought around to the different communities around the lakes. Uh, Post-conference, there were other activities that developed from that conference, but most notably was the youth that attended that conference uh, became uh, very interested in getting involved in these ideas of sustainable development too, to the point that they wanted to hold their own conference, which they did in 2018 in Port Hawkesbury. And um, they've since uh, continued to grow and progress in their initiatives, and now they would like to also have a conference pertaining to climate change. Now, because uh, the uh, Bordeaux Lakes biosphere, or, or pardon me, the Bordeaux Lakes CEPI is so uh, different in this environment in, in Canada, um, it's garnered a lot of attention. So the um, many organizations from around the, uh, the country and even internationally have expressed interest in what CEPI is doing, how we're organized, how two-eyed seeing works, because, as I said, we stand out as unique. 
They're, they often come to us to say, how do you get all levels of government to sit down together at one table and work together? And so we're often asked to, uh, to talk about that. Um, most recently, um, CEPI has, in 2019, co-hosted a climate change adaptation forum with um, the biosphere. And just to, to give you a, kind of a highlight of how we organize our work plan and budget, CEPI, uh, in our terms of reference, has four priorities that we like to focus our attention on. So our work plan is designed in that way to highlight those things. I'll just show you the, uh, the funding uh, portion of our budget here, where you can see how uh, all of the levels of senior council contribute to our, our work. Most uh, First Nations communities and municipalities uh, fund us to the, to the amount of $5,000 per year. And then these slides just show that the, each um, portion of the work plan focuses on a separate priority, uh, our institutional core work and the funding that goes with that. Social and cultural initiatives and priorities are then looked at and the budget that goes with that. Uh, environmental considerations and projects and that budget, and then the um, economic priorities and the budget that goes with that. So the CEPI only works because of partnerships. It's because all of these stakeholders come together at one table and uh, talk about issues, present issues, and then work together to solve them and make decisions that it works. Dr. Albert Marshall is quoted here as saying, if we all work together, there's absolutely nothing we cannot do. And that has certainly proved, proved true for CEPI in its 15 years of existence. And we see uh, no, no stop to that work in sight. So thank you very much for this opportunity. If there's any questions, I could try and answer them for you. OK. Uh, well, then, uh, if uh, I could, I'd like to introduce now uh, Paul Schwartz, who is just discussing another organization that works around the Bordeaux Lakes called Biduba. And he'll uh, tell you about that. Okay, well, uh, thank you, uh, Your Honor Mayor uh, Amanda McDougall. I'm very happy here, all the wonderful counselors and support staff. Uh, I'm, this is one of the first uh, in-person uh, uh, presentations I've made in a long time, and it's really nice to see people, so thank you. <laughs> so I know COVID protocol and all that, but uh, for me, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, we moved to Cape Breton, New Waterford in 1967, our family and I. So New Waterford and Cape Breton is very much home. And uh, Baduba has adopted me. And uh, CEPI and the UNIR have adopted Baduba. <laughs> and uh, without that kind of partnership, I don't think uh, you know, uh, we would be as uh, relevant and we don't want to duplicate anything. We want to kind of fit in where uh, needs need to be met. And uh, we follow the, sh uh, the same kind of principles. So if you can go to the next slide, I'll just, oh, I was supposed to give a five minute talk. So uh, I did this thing here, <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay, I don't want, you already have the uh, PowerPoint presentation. So I just want to kind of, so, um, Baduba was uh, originally um, something that the Nova Scotia Environment Department uh, initiated in uh, 2000. They started talking about the idea. They talked to elders, and they came up with the name uh, Baduba. I don't know if I pronounce it right. Uh, it all, you can also do it in the Gaelic way, Baduba, <laughs> with a guttural sound. 
that's what Mr. Uh, well, Chief Google told me in uh, Wekaba. But anyway, uh, Buruba means flowing into oneness. Flowing into oneness meant that the Bador Lakes were the only way Mi'kmaq nations, Unamagi, could uh, travel, meet with each other, congregate, and provided the livelihood. So what we're trying to do now is look at that whole traditional environmental knowledge, the seven generation concept. I know you're probably getting, uh, people use the seven generation thing like they use sustainable development. It's becoming too utilized. <laughs> but what we want to do is the Bordeaux Lakes have been here for millions of years. It has supported Mi'kmaq communities for centuries. We enjoy it now for all its beauty. We want to make sure that people that come after us, young people, seven generations hopefully, will uh, be able to see the same kind of and experience the same kind of things in the Bordeaux Lakes that we do, you know. So uh, that's the the big uh, idea. I guess we can go to the next slide. I'm just going to go whip through this. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Yeah, and uh, so initially... Um, you have to tat tat oh, I have to do it. What do I do? The mouse. There you, <laughs> go. There you go. Yep, right there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is me. I hear five years around the sun, and I don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. It's good to show your vulnerability. Anyway, uh, the Bajor Lakes originally. Oops, what's going on? <laughs> so, one of the things that the Bordeaux <coughs> Lakes, Baduba, all these people that we have want to remember, Russell Marshall, Charlie Dennis, Merdina Marshall, Weldon Bona, and Anthony Morris, they've all played a big part in Baduba over the last 20 years. And Baduba would like to, at some day, do some kind of a memorial for them, maybe a mural, I don't know, but this is in the works. Our current members include Stephen Gugu from Wakeaba, John McClellan, Inverness, Jason Piero from Wagmatkup, Paul McNeil, you all know Paul McNeil, Seppi, you know, Bertram Bear, Bernard, Escazoni, Steve Parsons, <laughs> Town, uh, District 7, Cyril McDonald, District 3, uh, they just joined us, so this is the first time I'm actually meeting them in person, it's kind of nice. Graham Marshall from member two. I'm going to, uh, I have a quote from you, Cyril, so I'm going to bubble it up here, but I'm going to get quotes from all the, uh, to, this is a work in progress. <laughs> One minute. Okay, Shirley McNamara is our chair. Brenda, uh, Stan Johnson, uh, these are our people, okay. So uh, sewage is the big thing that we've been working on and uh, we will continue to work on and we've done a lot of work on that. Now we want to work on climate change and we want to, uh, yes, Species at Risk project that CEPI and you and I are doing, we're helping with them. Climate change is a big issue and we're coming up with some action ideas for that. Hopefully some government funding will come. Sewage issues continue. We want to go towards a lower carbon economy, of course. So here we go, same thing that uh, Ron mentioned. So this is our contact information. You have that, but I just want to end off with this. It's not Albert Marshall, but I think Albert would uh, agree with Bal Black Elk. The earth is your grandmother and mother. She's sacred. Every step that is taken upon her should be as a prayer. So I'll end with that, and uh, thank you very much. No, uh, thank you. And Ron, if you want to come back up, uh, 
Do any of our members of council have any questions or comments for our presenters? And you can send, uh, uh, you know, a list of questions because sometimes people might want to reflect and if you have a sure. list. Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea and I'm so appreciative of your contact information being up there. Uh, I have one quick question regarding the UNESCO designation. Yeah. Uh, if Correct me if I'm wrong, it, does that go up for renewal every so often? And I thought perhaps maybe that's coming up soon? They did actually just go through an extensive review process over the last uh, year, I would say. I think those documents are submitted, aren't they, Stan? Are we working on it still? Uh, they may have actually gotten an extension because of COVID considerations, but yes, it is, uh, it is due. It's every 10 years, I believe. Every, oh, okay, great. And, and hopefully that will be renewed because I know how important that is to the protection of the species in that area. So, yes. yeah. No, nope. anybody? Okay, Councillor Steve Parsons. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd just like to say that being a part of the organization, it's certainly been an eye opener. I didn't realize that uh, such uh, entities existed, but they do great work. Uh, it involves a lot of different facets of the lakes and uh, living on the lake as I do, I appreciate all the work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further discussion or questions? Oh, Councillor Glenn Proust, then Councillor Sir McDonald. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I just have a question. When you mentioned sewage, are you talking about sewage heading out into the Bedore? Mm -hmm. Actually, <laughs> Baduba started with sewage as being the biggest problem from three different areas, boating from tourism and uh, treatment plants that were not uh, designed for capacity, you know, as population grows, and uh, some of them are very uh, located very close to the Bordeaux Lakes, where now the, 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 the water levels are going to rise and they're going to have to move. The other thing is uh, cottages that have been uh, <laughs> made into homes, uh, they still haven't upgraded their sewage, could be a tank. But unless uh, there's a complaint, department environment won't, you know, they don't go out and, but once we know there's a problem, then uh, they will go out and make sure that sewage, uh, on-site sewage is upgraded for the capacity. And these are, you know, there's multiple sources of sewage and it's a big one, but those are the three main things. So. Uh, pumping stations for boating, and we provide all the information. Here's a map. Here's where you go on load. We haven't done this for a while, but with CEPI and UNIR, they used to have the Coast Guard and the RCMP. We, they used to go out on the lakes, just say, hi, how you doing, everybody? And uh, maybe uh, a weekend or whatever, just to let people know as an outreach that, you know, we're watching you, but not. You can't. You, you, Bordeaux Lakes are huge. So you, you just got to provide uh, the opportunities for that. But did I answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sarah McDonald. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Paul, it's, uh, it's nice to meet you in person. Uh, I to <laughs> echo Councillor Parsons' comments. The work that, uh, that this group does is is quite remarkable. I'm just wondering though for, for my colleagues around the table, if you could s expand a little bit on some of the projects that the groups are, are currently working on. So uh, here you have climate change, but what does that mean to yeah. us? Uh, you just touched yeah. on the sewage issues and yeah. the, the lower uh, carbon economy. If you could just expand a little bit on those, just some context yeah. for all of yeah. us, that would okay. be great. So uh, with climate change is gonna be, uh, a big one because, uh, as you know, you know it's just landed on. It's overwhelming, but there are also funds on uh, federal and uh, different levels uh, for projects. Unfortunately, we we want to uh, pre preserve some areas right now that are being uh, eroded because of lack of ice. Malaga Wash is a place where, because there's no ice now in the winter, like. Places are getting eroded. Ch Chapel Island, Potlotek, it's, Chapel Island is eroding bad. 
And these are sacred places. And if we can concentrate on a few places, like Malaga Watch and, uh, and Chapel Island, uh, Portal Tech, and maybe a couple of areas in, in, in the municipalities where there's a lot of erosion due to lack of ice, we would like to put, uh, install some kind of, uh, there's different things. There's, uh, what do you call them, reef balls. There's uh, all kinds of uh, concrete structures that we can design because we don't have propriety to a lot of these things. So anyway, we have to work with uh, local concrete developers. Carbon Cure, uh, Robert Niven has offered his help in making sure that the concrete balls we make are you using the carbon capture process. So that's great. So we just have to find uh, a, a concrete plant close to our area that we want to uh, uh, protect because transportation and everything has to be kind of localized because you just can't carry these heavy uh, concrete things for miles. We want somebody to, to uh, design them and we're hoping the, the uh, <coughs> architecture school, Bruce Hatcher has, and uh, I think it's a Henderson in uh, BIO, they have, they have a lot of knowledge on, on, on uh, reef protection. So um, once we get some kind of funding, the latest funding we didn't get because uh, eco action, yeah. They said, sorry, uh, our priority is uh, freshwater lakes. <laughs> so Bordeaux Lake's not freshwater, but it is, in, you know. So anyway. Uh, hopefully, we'll get some funding for that kind of, these are the kind of projects. I'm talking too long here. Yeah. Thank you. We're not as limited with discussion time, so don't worry. If you feel like you want to add anything, by all means. I would. I could actually add, um, um, just so you're aware, uh, CEPI is, as I explained, an organization where all levels of government sit down. The Bidubog table is an opportunity for municipal uh, councils and uh, First Nations councils to sit at a table and discuss just their particular issues. But our issues tend to complement one another and we support one another and that's why we work together. Uh, in 2019, CEPI co-sponsored an event with the Biosphere, a climate change adaptation forum. And there's a report that came out of that forum which I believe would be available on their website if you're interested in, uh, in doing that reading. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, sorry, well, uh, one more. Uh, we did extensive studies. Uh, Jens Jensen um, studied the Bordeaux Lakes in a way that we wanted to uh, use a, 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 an engineering protocol that was designed to be able to predict climate change uh, and water level rise and what the uh, rise would mean for Unima, uh, Bordeaux Lakes and uh, a lot of the uh, sewage treatment plants and infrastructure right now would be underwater. And we have those reports and everything. So, uh, you know, um, these, this is his, a lot of data we already have. We started climate change uh, projects. Uh, Lori Shooter, I don't know if you know her name, but she was very uh, helpful in uh, getting us uh, partnerships and funding to do a lot of these projects with all kinds of partners. So uh, we have a lot of data already regarding um, what will happen in future. We, we have maps to show where the the inundation is going to happen and things like that. So the resources are there. What I can do is we can add to our to-do list for the evening that we can reach out uh, to both of you to get links uh, perhaps to those studies and reports and we'll make sure to provide them with to council if that's okay. Perfect. Excellent. We can actually make sure we send that all over to you. Stan, Stan can do that. So. Perfect. Stan knows how to find me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any further questions? Well, thank you. We, we have the utmost respect and gratitude for all of you for taking time out to come and educate us on um, the beautiful Bordeaux Lakes. So thank you kindly. 
Pardon me. So next we are going to item 3.2 on our agenda, which is Develop Nova Scotia, and they will be presenting an update on Lewisburg waterfront development. Uh, in our agenda, we did have Gordon Stevens down as our presenter, but tonight we get to welcome Brian Webb. Brian is the regional lead uh, for project planning and delivery at Develop Nova Scotia. So welcome, Brian. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. There we go. So, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Council and staff, for the chance to give this presentation uh, this evening. For anybody who knows Gordon Stevens, uh, I'm obviously not him, uh, but uh, I do want to thank him for not being able to show up because in these times, it's a real treat to actually get to see people in person. So that, that's uh, even if I can only see half of your face unless you take off your mask to ask a question. So please ask lots of questions. Uh, so basically, I, I'm tonight going to get the chance to give you a, an overview of a project concept that we've been working on, that Develop Nova Scotia has been working on with uh, both the community and key stakeholders in Lewisburg for the past number of years. And this concept builds on plans that have been uh, undertaken for quite a number of years uh, and that have received uh, support from council over the past number of years as well, as early as 2016. Uh, and I know in 2017, they included the identification of the old RV park in Lewisburg uh, for the purposes of creating a, a visitor welcome center in this area. So this, this concept that I'm going to present is both new and old at the same time. So uh, we want to thank you for your support over the years, because thanks to the perseverance both of council and the community members that we've been working with, the project really hasn't died. It's really uh, just con continued to refine itself. And, and we've really, we really believe that a lot of the the obstacles that had been addressed in, uh, in the first uh, initial plans that have, have were presented to council over the years, we believe that they have uh, some of the situations have changed over the past number of years. So what I want to do first is just give you a quick overview of Develop Nova Scotia and who we are, because many people probably are wondering who, who I am and why, why I'm talking about the Lewisburg waterfront. So I just wanted to give you a quick overview of what we do. So at Develop Nova Scotia, we're a crown corporation that we develop places that attract people to live, visit, work, and participate uh, in the economy. So basically what we're trying to do is increase population to the province, uh, to increase the value of our tourism product across the province, uh, to increase the number of business startups and grow the economy and also to increase economic participation in the province. And this we like to call our, our donut model uh, and, and basically what I know you can't really see it on the screen but hopefully you guys can see it in, in your agenda. Uh, but basically it, it outlines where we consider our work to take place. So we are really focused on working with communities uh, to build projects. Everything that we do needs to be community led. So we call that our social foundation. So every project needs to have a level of support from the community and be led by, the, by community groups in order for us to consider uh, participating in that project. On the other end of the donut, we have what we call our ecological ceiling. So we want to be working on projects that are really uh, contributing to the regeneration of the, uh, the environment not, uh, and not making uh, too much impact on, on the environment as we're doing our work. So between those two rings is where we do our work. Uh, and the three areas that we focus our work are on thriving communities, which uh, many of you will know our work with, uh, with the Internet for Nova Scotia funds. So we're trying to enable global connectedness and accessibility for, for communities across the province. But it also in this thriving communities pillar, we're trying to build placemaking capa capacity in communities. And what that means is both it's both what we create, but also how we create it. So we're trying to build that capacity in communities to enable locally led socially, social and economic infrastructure in projects in those communities. So that's our thriving communities uh, pillar. We also work uh, with authentic destinations, which are tourism def differentiators that we identify around the province. So what are, what are, the, what are those uh, icons around the province that we that have a focus on year-round operations? And we can really work with and provide new places for both community and visitors to gather uh, and start create startups and grow in, the, in those areas. And the final pillar that we work in is the working waterfronts. And so that's kind of where we've come from. Our history is, is, is supporting this ecosystem that develops along the water's edge throughout the province. 
So with those pillars uh, as, as, our, uh, as our key, the most important thing, and I know I've said it a couple of times already, is that we never do anything on our own. We're always working with communities. Our role is just simply to be here to help move this important project forward. Uh, it's, we get to present this concept, but it does build on years of hard work that have been done by the community, by community groups, stakeholders, CBRM staff, and, and the council as well so over the years. So, just to give you a quick background uh, of this project and, and develop Nova Scotia's involvement in it, uh, approximately two, two years ago, since, since 2012, pro project plans have been, uh, been circulating in the community. Uh, but in, in 2018, Develop Nova Scotia was invited by a number of um, partners in the community, including Parks Canada, Lewisburg Seafoods, uh, Synergy Lewisburg, CBRM yourself, as well as the Cape Breton Center for Crafts and Design to really start tying together a number of different pieces uh, of, of some projects that were uh, underway on the Lewisburg waterfront. And the biggest thing uh, that was identified, uh, which I'm sure many of you are aware, is that Many economic opportunities in the community of Lewisburg are currently being lost because 95,000 people treat the, the main, main street of the community more like a thoroughfare than a destination. So they're passing right through the community, going to the visitor center, which is about three kilometers out of town, and not stopping in the community at all. And we want to change that, is essentially what we want to try to do. And I, I kind of mentioned a little earlier that some of, some of the obstacles that were in place previously, we believe there has been a change in that. And one of the main ones there that I want to identify is that there's a real motivation now to relocate the Parks Canada ticketing services from where they are outside of town to the center of Lewisburg itself. Uh, in addition, uh, we have been working very closely with private industry in Lewisburg and have identified uh, the landowner of a key asset in the community that is really, we're looking to utilize those existing assets that exist in the community and uh, they have really responded well to that and have been supportive of discussions with us to even take on a, a head lease for that site to manage overall operations uh, of this new new uh, complex to be developed in, in, the, in the community of Lewisburg. Uh, so. What we're trying to do through this project is create a single location, a cluster of activity in the center of Lewisburg uh, with multiple experiences for both locals and visitors. So it's, it's key to say that because even though we're calling this a visitor experience enhancement project, uh, the reality is that we find at DNS, what we say all the time is that the single biggest attraction for people are other people. Uh, so when there's activity and people in a location, when locals are using a, a, a location, visitors naturally want to be there. So we tend to try to build for local people so that then the visitors can follow. And the other thing about the background of this project is we're, we're using this as the starting point. So it's the foundation. It is the catalyst for additional opportunities. It's not everything that could ever be done in Lewisburg all at once. We're trying to make that first step and catalyze these additional opportunities throughout the community. So to take you through uh, what, what, we're, what we're calling our big moves, uh, so what we basically looked at is, okay, we're at X, we want to get to Y. What are, what are these big moves? And we've kind of come up with six big moves for this concept. And the first I've already mentioned briefly, but essentially today it's more of a thoroughfare. We want to get to a point of destination where people want to be in the center, where people need to stop, and this becomes their key point of entry to the entire Lewisburg experience. So that's, that's move number one. Uh, the second one goes to our mandate as developed Nova Scotia, which is that we want to build this by the community and for the community. And so there's two different components to that. The first I've mentioned, which is the fact that we always do things with other partners. So it needs to be a community-led project. And the second is that second piece, which is if you build for locals, the visitors will come. So that's what we're trying to do, is build it both by the community and for the community. And the key of this concept is what we call a collect and disperse move. Uh, so by creating a single point of entry for people, we want to collect all 95,000 people in one area and then disperse them to the community and to the fortress. So we always make sure we say it in that order because yes, naturally people are there to see the fortress, but we want our focus to be on distributing them throughout the community as well. So what are the additional experiences that they can have in this community, and how can we turn two hours into two days is essentially what we're trying to look at when we're, when we're creating this, uh, this approach to, to, to this project. 
The fourth big move that we're trying to make is uh, what we call iterative and incremental, which I know sounds really jargony, but the point behind it is that what we want to do is we want to adapt to changes as they happen. So we want to observe how things are being used at the site and then make changes as needed. So we want to avoid overbuilding up front. Uh, so for example, we, we don't want to we don't want to create an asphalt jungle on, on a waterfront. We want to create only what is needed and then watch how things are used and make changes as they are required uh, throughout the plan. So if we notice that more people are looking for ice cream and people are asking for ice cream and there's no ice cream stand, we want to then make sure that we start building that in for, for, for New Year for the next year's season and things like that. So that's just one example of how we would do it. It also works with parking where we have a number of different surfaces of parking. We could expand or contract them based on how many people are using them over the time. So we want it to be able to uh, work like an accordion, not like something that's set in, uh, in concrete. Um, the fifth big move that we are trying to make, I've already mentioned, so I'll just pass through it quickly, but the, we want to make sure that this is a place for the community, uh, where they feel that they want to be, that the people from local regions 30 minutes away, such as yourself, uh, are feeling like they can come down and spend some time on the waterfront, and they just want to be there. And by doing that, we believe that people, when they return from their day at the fortress, will also want to stay there and have, have a drink, have, have a meal, watch their kids play, go out, hike the, hike the Lewisburg uh, the Lighthouse Trail, and, and just spend, spend more time in the community in that way. We can capture people for more than just one, one day. We can have them stay overnight as well. And the final and sixth big move that I have here is uh, we want to see this as a foundation for future growth. So we were actually in Lewisburg today meeting with the community to, to kind of discuss how they see themselves in this plan and what additional opportunities could come out of this. So we're, we, we see ourselves as creating that center of a nucleus, and we want it to expand beyond and have the community really grab onto all the different ideas that they can see uh, for themselves in this plan as we move forward to past year one and two uh, of, of creating this. So just very quickly, um, because I'm cognizant of the time, I want to just walk through the, the overall concept of the plan. And it's important just to note that this is conceptual at this stage. We, uh, later, I'm going to show you where we are in our roadmap, uh, where we need to move into more detailed design. Uh, the difference that I try to make sure I point out to that is, is when it comes to a concept, we're, we're getting those big high level ideas. And at the end of the day, if road X becomes the entry or road Y becomes the entry, that's, that's a detail that we go through in design. But the concept is we want to get people to the waterfront. So, so that's just how we're, we're trying to look at it. But the four, the four different kind of key points that I want to point out in this concept, that how, what it involves is number one, going back to that whole, we want to see this as a destination. The first step is your arrival into the community of Lewisburg itself. So we want people to feel like they are arriving at a center of a town, not that they're in the middle of a highway to continue on to a further destination. So the first step involves uh, slowing down Main Street uh, so that it feels more like it's a 50 kilometer zone than, than, than a highway. So, so we have a number of different options around that, including boats and crosswalks, slight narrowing of roads, things like that, to really create that sense of arrival. Uh, so that helps to then slow people down for the left turn, uh, which is not, not something that they are currently used to doing. So we want to slow traffic down so they make that left. And the key is to make it as easy as possible for cars to get from the main street to the waterfront area, and then vice versa, make it as easy for pedestrians as possible to get from the waterfront area back to main street, because this is not intended to be the only, as I said, this is a foundation for further ec economic growth, and we want people back on main street and revitalizing that. Main Street and the businesses up there as well. Uh, so that's step one, is the, the, the roadways into the center. Step two is uh, the parking. And I already mentioned how we're trying to make this iterative. There are certain needs that Parks Canada has for, for parking numbers, but we want to take a dispersed parking model that does not try to overbuild parking on the waterfront. So we have, we have tried to create enough parking space, not just on site itself, but within a five minute walk of the site. And the reason we came up with the five minute piece is currently at their visitor center in Lewisburg. The furthest away parking spots are about five minutes walk from the visitor center. So we're trying to keep that same model when it comes to, to parking in the area. So there's a few different things of <coughs> parking that go to the uh, iterative nature of this, which is we're trying to build as little asphalt as possible. Uh, so we have some asphalt necessary for accessible and very or free parking, which is great, so that, so that we can uh, easily move uh, people with mobility issues into, into the area. Uh, and, but then from that, we also have uh, 
gravel parking lots for a lot of the spaces so that it can be used both for parking in the main season but also can maintain the working waterfront uses as an off season. So for example, boat storage can still be, um, be done in off seasons and it can drain properly and allow for the industrial uses that are currently available on site. And for the the third uh, type of surface that we would have, we also have some grass parking as well for overflow areas that would allow it to expand and contract if, uh, for example, there's less parking needed and more public space could be made available. So the fourth piece uh, is, is the center, the cluster at the center of the nucleus, which is the, the old craft center complex is essentially what we are proposing you to use for this, this, this purpose. And there are five different, four different uh, experiences that we have identified for this site. So obviously Parks Canada would take over, put, take over one building, which is uh, building number three on your agenda for both their ticketing services, for both their ticketing services and their visitor arrival. Uh, buildings four and five at the top would be under, remain with uh, Lewisburg Seafoods for their labs. Cape Breton Center for Crafts and Design would uh, undertake an artisan residency program on the building number two. And building number one, although we don't have a tenant yet, we envision this as a food and beverage um, uh, opportunity. So I'm going to skip over a quick slide and just kind of give you an overview of the project costs and funding. And it's important to note that these are order of magnitude estimates at this stage. And as we go through design, we would be looking at detailed costing to, to be confirmed in that stage. So through order of magnitude, it's about $2.3 million that this project is looking to, uh, to, to cost. And we have anticipated funding partners, including uh, we have identified provincial funding through the NSCRC Thriving Communities Fund. Uh, and we, we have a substantial um, uh, amount there that we believe it will be put towards that contingent on uh, getting other partners to come to the table, such as ACOA and Parks Canada, that have indicated uh, that they are open to conversations about building upgrades, parking, and public space. We've also begun conversations, obviously, with uh, CBRM about potential funding or accessing funding for, for some parts of this project. Nothing has been committed to date, uh, but we have been, begun those conversations, and there's also private sector uh, funding that uh, will go into this as well. And this is our roadmap, which I will leave off because my time is up. But <laughs> my apologies. Uh, is there, are there any questions? Councillor James Edwards. Thank you, Brian. Nice to uh, meet you after uh, uh, several uh, uh, Zoom uh, calls. You're taller. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thanks for your uh, presentation. It's, uh, it's great. And uh, uh, the, the first time I, I heard it was... Uh, Great as well, and uh, uh, so happy that uh, um, to to have this presentation. And, and the question that might be, uh, well, why Lewisburg? And and the the, the obvious response is why not? Uh, like you say, there's there's 95,000 people going there. Uh, how do we uh, work to uh, uh, maximize the uh, 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 tourism uh, uh, destination, the uh, tourism dollars? Uh, I, I love the plan. Uh, today is uh, uh, going to be interesting. I'm looking forward to the community uh, consultation process to to, to see uh, uh, exactly where the uh, residents, uh, uh, what kind of feedback we get there. But uh, I can uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, any conversations that I've had over the past couple of months with uh, residents uh, from Lewisburg, uh, everybody's in favor. There's there's a lot happening in in, uh, in Lewisburg. And uh, you know, it's uh, why not between the uh, the fortress and the uh, the waterfront. The uh, you name them all in your in your presentation. The uh, lighthouse trail, uh, you know, the, the SNL uh, uh, railway uh, museum. It's just there's just so many positive uh, uh, vibes uh, happening. Um, and and it, it's you know what uh, I already said tourism probably twice in my my speech here, but it's also uh, designed to help with uh, locals and to uh, 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 for locals to uh, uh, enjoy the um, uh, their their time in Lewisburg as well, but uh, to uh, enhance the, uh, the the presence in the downtown to rejuvenate the uh, uh, the commercial the uh, restaurants and the, uh, the the attractions. I mean, it wasn't too long ago where uh, where Lewisburg was a, a happening spot and it sort of uh, uh, fell down there in the last uh, few years. And I see this as a, a real uh, positive to, uh, uh, to bring it back. And you know, uh, we talk about the, uh, the fortress, that's a gimme, isn't it? 
you know, when, when people come to uh, Cape Breton, they're going to uh, uh, go to the uh, Cabot Trail or they're going to play golf. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell, and I'd like to make that analogy in, in, a, in a second here as far as Badek is concerned. But the fortress is, is on the uh, top of the uh, list for uh, people visiting Cape Breton to go visit. So, uh, and you know what? There's so much more in Lewisburg uh, as well. You know, if anybody uh, has, has never experienced uh, Kennington Cove, for example, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's just to, to drive out there and, and enjoy it, even if you don't swim. I, I don't know how you couldn't swim if you went out there, but uh, it's just uh, uh, great. The other uh, point that you made, and I'm happy you uh, alluded to in your uh, presentation, was the passion of the community members. Uh, it was uh, something that really uh, that I really noticed uh, during my campaign and since being elected in the area, the, uh, the, the, the community members. Uh, I'm sure you've learned already there's, there's lots of varying opinions, but everybody has the same vision to uh, uh, make, make Lewisburg a, a happening spot, make Lewisburg great again, and uh, that, that is going to happen. I'm, con I'm convinced of that. Um, but the... Uh, the the, the utilizing the existing uh, assets, you're, you're so bang on there and the, uh, the catalyst for uh, future expansion. The possibilities uh, are endless, not only for uh, the tourism uh, experience in Lewisburg, but even after we keep them in uh, Lewisburg for uh, a, a day or two, and then to go down the Marconi Trail this, this year, uh, we're going to uh, see the Myra Gut Bridge uh, come back to uh, enhance the experience to go down along the coast in through Maury, and then again, there's beaches dotted uh, along the uh, coastline there into Glace Bay where there are, are what, five museums, and there are three museums, pardon me. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's, all, it's all good news, and this uh, uh, um, idea from uh, Develop Nova Scotia, uh, I just couldn't support it uh, enough, and, and thank you again uh, for your presentation. The, uh, I, I repeat myself, but I'm really uh, looking forward to, uh, uh, to get the uh, feedback from today's community consultations. And uh, um, we will uh, speak again in the future. Thanks again. Oh, Councillor Steve Gillespie. Thank you, uh, Mayor McDougall, uh, and thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I've always thought that realistically Lewisburg could be the next BEDEC uh, and even could be bigger, especially based on the numbers that we have. And, um, you know, BEDEC is a destination. Uh, Lewisburg could be even more of a destination, I think. Um, have there been any conversations about the highway um, around uh, Lewisburg? Because I know that a lot of people talk about access to that part of the island from St. Peter's. Um, where, where is that, uh, and is that something that you're discussing? Uh, the other thing is, uh, the conceptual drawing uh, is fantastic, and I love, I love the way it's put together and, uh, and uh, you know, enhancing what you already have versus what can be there. But a lot of this really does focus on the visitor and ticket center with the federal government, because if, if that is not in stone and ready to go, um, what would happen to this project? So to, to answer your first question, uh, I can honestly say that's outside the scope of, of what we were putting together, the, the conversations about um, uh, highways. Uh, that's, that's more uh, under TIR or other, other jurisdictions. The, the roadway in, in town did come into the conversation simply because it is CBRM uh, maintained roads, so, so we were able to deal with that, but anything that was on highways was not part of this, this project specifically. Um, your second question around uh, a lot of this revolves around visitation and, and Parks Canada. So we, we have the support of Parks Canada for this. They have, are very motivated to, to move uh, the project. I, thankfully, because you asked this question, I get to reference now this last slide, which includes our, our roadmap to, to uh, upper light operationalization, uh, because basically we have a goal of trying to get this operational by June of 2022. Uh, so in the next 14, 15 months is, is what we're trying to do, uh, because there's a real motivation 
motivation for Parks Canada to close down the former visitor center and, and move it to the center of the community. So we've been working very closely with Parks Canada. Um, we, we, of course, we, what we always try to say is we, the way I would say it is we believe we have a path to completion with them, but until obviously you nail down all funding sources, we, we, we can't say for sure we're digging uh, in June uh, of this year, but we have we believe we have a path to, to get this across the line. And, uh, but it is, it, it is a crucial part of maintaining, because it's 95,000 people in the center, which really makes a difference to the businesses in that area. Uh, so we want to make sure that yes, uh, that's the crucial part of this, but when we build that, we want to make sure we're focusing on the local community first, as, as far as it goes to making sure that it's usable for the community. Thank I hope you. that answers your question. Yeah, it does, and I really think that this is a fantastic opportunity for Lewisburg, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, just for clarity, I'm, I'm kind of compiling a bit of a to-do list of things to follow up on. Did you, were you referencing the, the former Lewisburg Gabarus Road and the yes. extension of the, the trail there? Yes, I was, yeah. Okay, I can add that to the list today then that we can reach out to MP Mike Calloway and see if there has been any progress from Parks Canada uh, on that file. Uh, next, we have Councillor Eldon McDonald. Thanks very much, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm going to have to uh, try to wave my hand earlier because everybody seems to be stealing my comments ahead of me. Um, just following up on a couple of comments from Councillor Gillespie, I was going to ask uh, similar type of questions. Uh, I can say I've recently have been involved in several uh, Zoom meetings with MLA PAN on the trail extension in regards to the Florida League coming through there. So I think there's some activities happening there, uh, maybe not through your organization, but I was going to ask if there was any communication with you guys. So maybe that's something that can be worked on in the future, but you got to take step one and then step two. Um, so I'm glad to hear that, that that's a potential. Um, and uh, I guess a comment I think that you made earlier, uh, I, I've been saying it since I've been elected in 2012, we need to do things for our local people, not for the visitors, because if we do it for our local people and we're enjoying what we do for our locals, the visitors will automatically enjoy it. Um, I'm councillor for District 5, downtown Sydney. I say about the uh, Sydney Ports Corp all the time. Um, the cruise ship passengers come in there. I hear my constituents say all the time, we need to be making downtown better for our, our cruise uh, visitors. And I say, no, we need to be making downtown better for our own residents. And then the cruise visitors will automatically get to enjoy what we enjoy. So I'm glad that's the philosophy. Uh, that's how we need to think, I think. Uh, we need to do things to build up our community so that we have better attractive opportunities 12 months of the year and not just in the summer season. And uh, obviously, you guys are thinking, thinking in the same light. So glad to hear that. Um, I guess I'll ask a question, though. I was a big supporter of, of the Synergy Project uh, coming back, I'll say, 2013, 14, 15, uh, and uh, attended all the open houses when they had them there presenting their, their, their projects and their, their presentations. Um, is there anything that you would say has changed substantially in that? Because I thought that particular project was fabulous. It sounds like this is very, very similar. But is there any major deviations from that that you would be able to note for me? Uh, and yeah, just the comment on Bedeck. I've always said Lewisburg should be our Bedeck, so Councillor Gillespie stole that for me. But if you could answer in regards to uh, the the question, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. So um, the, the the quick the quick answer to that is yes, it's very very similar to to past plans. It builds on those plans, but uh, it does. I, I think it removes some of the obstacles that were in place in the past. Uh, the biggest of which was uh, I know probably if anybody who has been following this sort of project since 2012 knows there's been a lot of different iterations to that that plan because a lot of hard work was done uh, by that group as well as other groups within the community. Um, but the biggest change that kind of has come to place is that this really focuses on utilizing and enhancing existing assets. So I, I know some of the initial conversations were around building new uh, on, on, that, on that site. So we really feel that one of the big game changers from this project is both the fact that we're using existing infrastructure, the old craft center complex, and and we have uh, the support of the private uh, owners of that facility to enter into a long-term leasehold agreement where Develop Nova Scotia would manage the site and uh, we're also discussing with uh, CBRM staff around also the surrounding lands and basically managing the entire site as a single entity so that we can ensure that the proper and uh, well-suited uh, businesses are in place to 
attract visitors to that area and keep them longer. Because that's one of the things that I uh, wanted to make sure I got across is that while this is great for Lewisburg, it's also great for the entire municipality because Ooh. two two hours becomes two days. Absolutely. So right now there's not a lot of uh, overnight stays in, in the Lewisburg area, so they have to stay somewhere, so they're going to span out from that area. So as you're putting people in the area and in encouraging them just to, you know, getting back from the fortress and deciding to have a, have a drink and a meal in Lewisburg, now they have to stay overnight. And so so, so that is, it, it kind of, it helps with the entire area when it comes to, to visitors coming to the area. And as well, as many people have pointed out, we're hoping that this does become that bedeck where people go from uh, Sydney for the day to the waterfront and have, have, have a meal on the water's edge down, down in Lewisburg as well. So I hope that I at least answered some of the questions. And if I didn't, please forgive me. It does. I don't know, Madam Mayor. Do I have any time left or am I out? Yep. You okay. have... Just, just quickly on the overnight thing, and I've said this in the in the Zoom meetings with MLA Pond. I think the the Florida Lee Trail coming through there is is a huge asset uh, that should be considered to look at because people will come into Sydney automatically, and I mean I'm the council for downtown Sydney. I want them in downtown Sydney, but there's an opportunity where they're going to avoid Lewisburg, come into downtown <laughs> Sydney, and then maybe oh maybe we won't get to Lewisburg today. Maybe we'll go to the trail. If they come in through that way, you want to keep them in Lewisburg for the day, keep them in the playhouse in the evening, keep them overnight, then send them to Sydney and they get them to spend the night in Sydney, then send them somewhere else. But not having that opportunity to loop in through that way first creates an opportunity for them to say, well, we're in Sydney, we've been here longer than we thought, maybe we won't go to Lewisburg today. If they come in the other way, they're gonna hit Lewisburg first. They're not gonna leave, most likely, and pass by Sydney without stopping or other destinations in our municipality. We've gotta work on those, but I think that trail is something that consider that loop to make it more prosperous for everyone. So, just thoughts of mine. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any further comments or questions? Um, again, I will be sure to reach out to MLA Pond and also MP Calloway just to get an idea where that Lewisburg Gabarus Road uh, project stands, uh, if there's been any movement. In the, oh, Councillor Darren Brookschweiger. Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor, and uh, thanks, Brian, for the uh, presentation. Um, it was your firm that's doing Peggy's Cove as well, the platform, All right? Huh? Good. Yeah, that's a, that looks like a, it's going to be a very interesting uh, project. Um, there's no question this is uh, uh, excellent as far as um, uh, the design and everything in the plan, and it has been talked about for several years. Um, so where we are uh, budget-wise on this uh, proposal, Brian, um, so we're looking at uh, building an upgrade 735, you're saying, 1.556, civil and transportation. You're looking at costs to do the design plus the concrete work, sidewalks, and roadway, right? So did you have that broke down any further as far as we your rough estimate on what it would cost to do the work for the municipality? We we do okay. uh, we have it we have it broken down further which uh, we can make available uh, to sure. to you uh, but I, I do want to caution that it, it, they are order of magnitude they would need to be refined in the detailed design phase okay. which would be undertaken probably this summer okay. is what we would be looking at uh, to do that but yes we do have breakdowns sure. uh, just they would need to be refined that's great I'm just wondering uh, Madam Mayor if I could. Um, with all the different programs that have been announced uh, federally, provincially, uh, this is a great project. Uh, it's something that I think should be priority as far as our movement. And I think we have to, uh, as you pointed out, we got to meet with Mike Calloway and uh, Jamie Batiste, whoever is involved there, um, to really sit down and talk about how they can help us on our end to make this happen as well. Um, I think there's funds out there and uh, maybe through you to the director, he may have some suggestions on, on what can be done. But this has to be one to put on the list of importance. If it doesn't start this year, uh, we should have something ready to roll next year, in my opinion. Um, so I, I think I'll let Wayne sit on that. That'll be a discussion, I think, for another day. But I think it's important that with the different funds and different uh, uh, levels out there with COVID and all the different things they're trying to help communities with, there may be some help there. Overnight stays is probably the biggest one we got for, uh, if you're talking about doing things for your community, uh, this will help with restaurants and job creation, in my opinion, in Lewisburg, but it's the same problem we have in Glace Bay and area. 
it's no overnight stay, right? So people get comfortable as point out a meal and a drink. Maybe they want to have two, but then they still got to uh, make that trip, right? And uh, uh, so we've got that same issue out in Glace Bay area where I'm at as well, as long with, along with James as well, who's also in Lewisburg and Kenny, of course. So it's a big one. It's been uh, looked at through every study we did, the importance of it. Um, so I'm hoping that some developer will look at that, the same as I do for Lewisburg. As pointed out, 95,000 uh, visitors going through that area. I mean, what a just a... A great opportunity right for for the community and that overnight stay would so just make it so much better for the business community there because it's a nice nice community as pointed out with the Lewisburg there that's our uh, our staple right so uh, thanks for this Brian am, uh, am I allowed to make a quick response? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. As, so I just wanted to comment on so two things the first being what you said about an overnight stay yes absolutely it's something that we've identified as being key but uh, and I think we've reiterated this a few times it's a first it's the first step to yes. that so so while we might not be able to guarantee an overnight stay in year two we know that this is the first step towards towards sure. the, things like that and to your <laughs> comment as well about finding funding uh, from the various sources I, I I mentioned it very briefly as I was going through but that's one of the things that we have done as well and can assist with is trying to find additional sources of funding for this and we have identified a funding source provincially uh, for this and, and it is uh, related to, to to different funding sources that have become available in, in, in yeah. recent history so we have the provincial side of, of funding accessible to us so I just wanted to kind of point that out so is that part of this Brian if I could ask yes yeah, so, so it, it, the anticipated funding is from the provincial side is through the NSCRC thriving communities fund okay. that has been, has okay. been created. thank you Pardon me. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? So I will be sure to add that to our, our to-do list for the day as well, is to really be sure that we're keeping this top of mind in terms of priorities and also do some research through our municipal networks as well uh, when it comes to potential funding. So uh, again, uh, so much gratitude for all of the work that's been done on this. It's lovely when a, a current corporation comes in and, and takes the lead on developing our communities. So. Uh, Lots of gratitude for the time and effort, and we continue to um, look forward to this partnership. Okay, now we can move on to item 3.3, Society for the Improvement of Accessible Transportation. We have the one and only Marcy Sheree uh, Stanley here. Uh, she did previously uh, advise there were going to be some other company coming with her, but we get Marcy uh, on her own this evening to present to us in council. So we'll just get everything set up for you, Marcy. Well, I'm glad there's no chickens here this year. <laughs> there's only the last time I presented. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Mayor McDougall, councillors and staff, uh, I want to th uh, thank everyone for uh, allowing me uh, to present before you. I asked to especially because there's eight new councillors and that's, I guess, two-thirds of, of council that are new. And uh, I guess I want to make one quote, and it basically sums it up as to one of the reasons that I'm here. And it says, tell me I could forget. Show me, I may remember, but involve me, and I will understand. So uh, this is, uh, my presentation is much different uh, than the other presentations, uh, we are not looking for money. This is a success story, and you'll see uh, as I go through this why I said that. Handy Trance, which, by the way, from humble beginnings in 1978, was uh, introduced by community involvement of the disabled. 
the community involvement of the disabled was an organization set up by persons with disabilities mainly, and that was a voice of our own, but mainly was the tagline, because at that time, it was mainly other people doing for us. We wanted to do for ourselves. And transportation, of course, was one of the really important things. By the way, Mayor McDougall, could you please give me a, a sign or tell me when I'm 10 minutes through? I promise. Okay. Uh, so one bus <laughs> in 1978, one bus was donated by the Kiwanis in Sydney, and it covered only Sydney. Uh, a second bus was donated in 1980, the New Waterford Rotary, and it was, I don't know if some of you are aware of the, what they had, was a, a Walter Callow bus, uh, and that was an accessible bus, but, um, and that covered Industrial Cape Breton, and for those of you who are younger here, Industrial Cape Breton was mainly Sydney, Glace Bay, New Waterford, North Sydney, and Sydney Mines. So uh, later on in 1980, provincial funding came through the Department of Transportation, after Handy Trans was uh, was integrated with Transit Cape Breton. So I'm here as the chair of the Society for the Improvement of Accessible Transportation, which was incorporated as a nonprofit society on May the 13th, 2005. The majority of our board members are Handy Trans users, going back the, again to the consumer and persons with disabilities having their own voice. And its mandate is basically self-explanatory. We're there to advocate for an improvement for uh, accessible transportation. Oh, I forgot to tell you, the, my, my outline uh, has changed. It's past, present, and future. So what I just finished was the past. And now I'm gonna go on to the, to the present. Uh, but before I do that, handy trans is what they call uh, parallel transit. Parallel transit is named that because the buses were not accessible to people with disability, they couldn't use regular transit. Then a parallel system was set up. And in order to apply, you had to have a disability and there was an application process. But this is where the success end of it comes in. I mentioned one bus. Started with one bus, very involved, the community did it all. And today we have eight buses presently. And every year we usually get, uh, or the municipality usually gets a new bus uh, from the provincial government's accessibility uh, transportation assistance program. And I'm happy to say that Kathy Kathy Donovan and myself worked on this, the ATAP program for 2020, 2020 and 2021, that fiscal year, the funding was uh, $50,000, 50% funding up to 50,000. But I just found out yesterday for the 2021 uh, and 2022 fiscal year that the 50% funding is going up to 60,000. Uh, I was in touch uh, with my good friend Greg Sewell, who hears from me all the time there at the, the department there, and mentioned that the buses have now gone up in price. I think originally when, when this was introduced, this program, they were around 100,000, and I think right now uh, they're between, well, around 20 or 20, 120 or 125,000. So, uh, and of course, what else is coming up is that the Prime Minister recently, very recently, I think just last week, announced the largest public transportation investment in Canada history. Now that'll have to be worked out with the provinces, they'll all have to sign on individually, but it's something to keep, to keep track of. Nova Scotia has the highest percentage of persons with disabilities in Canada. Let me go back uh, to Handy Trans again. Uh, the service area, and this is not all inclusive, the CBRM, just to mention, because some of you can relate to the different areas, it goes to Manadou, Lewisburg, Irish Vale, Brador, Gabarus, Myra, Escazoni. And to remember, Handy Trans and one bus 
one bus driver in the, in, on one shift can go three to 400 kilometers. So that's one big difference from the regular transit. And this is the thing, I, uh, it's, it's not a, a true reflection if you lump the both together. I'm always saying it's handy trans and regular transit, and I'm gonna get into that for the future again. So uh, the service is um, uh, Monday to Friday. There's uh, four buses on from seven in the morning to 10 in the night. And from 11 to seven, there's an additional bus on. On Saturday, there's only two buses on to cover all of CBRM from seven to five. And from five to <coughs> 10, there's one more bus. And then on Sunday, from 11 to seven p.m., uh, there's one bus. So uh, the extended service was on September the 14th, uh, 2020. Uh, that, was, uh, that was just after COVID. And also the Sunday service was uh, uh, reintroduced because we did have that before, before COVID in, uh, in November. The ridership, profile of the ridership, 70% of the people that use handy trans, which is a lifeline for, I'd say, most, well, 80 or 90% use it for medical reasons. 20% use it for employment, and only 10% use it for leisure activities. So uh, uh, that's important to remember. I'm going to now go on to uh, the future, which is going to include recommendations. I recommend, and I'm not, and this is from primary research. In other words, this is from talking to people who use the bus. So it's not your secondary data, it's a primary data. And I recommend that right now, it's, transportation is uh, an essential service by the provincial government in regards to uh, a state of emergency. And that's every, I think every 30 days they renew that. So I'm, I'm saying that this should be in uh, an essential service forever, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, also, I talked about regular transit and handy trans. Uh, and I'd like to look into this more, because I've mentioned it to a couple of people in the management at the CBRM. With regards to financial statements, uh, regular transit and handy trans, there should be two separate lines items because as far as from my own financial background there's, it's not a true reflection of handy trans uh, when it's lumped together for one for one thing i'm sure i'm not 100 percent sure but I, i'm i'm pretty sure maintenance in, in regular transit is much higher than handy trans for a couple of reasons one is a lot of, uh, there's a bigger uh uh, there's, a, there's a larger number of buses, and uh, a lot of them are not brand new, which re with regards to handy trans, uh, the rolling stock is one of its strengths. Staff is another strength. Uh, I've used accessible transportation in Quebec. I've used it in, uh, in Orlando. I've used it in Vegas. I've uh, used it those places specifically, and none can compare to the service that we have here. And as you've seen, the growth of it from one <coughs> bus to, to eight buses. Mercy, you're at 10 minutes. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so the other thing is the regular transit and handy trans. During COVID, uh, handy trans is an on-demand service. During COVID, uh, uh, the bus, the regular bus is really suffering with, with low ridership. But ha handy trans, that's not happening. It's, it is slow in the nights, but in the daytime, it's very busy. So that's, that, that's, uh, that's two uh, different uh, things that's important. This, the third thing is in the upcoming budget, because I know we're very close to uh, the budget, uh, I would like to add a line for contingency. Uh, the reason for that is because presently we're still into COVID. Now that there's vaccinations, uh, that might change. 
and it, it, we might have uh, the reason that it's reduced in the nighttime is because there's nothing open, so people can't really go anywhere. So all I'm saying is don't use or, or look in another six months to review that. And I'm not sure how you do it, but take that into consideration. And uh, um, I think I think that's about it. I wanted to mention uh, one other thing, and that that's a really uh, a really nice success story, and uh, people here from the Glace Bay area, I don't know if you know Ron Canary, uh, his brother at one time was a counselor, but if, if you're all familiar with the, the, uh, 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 the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, section 15, Ron Canary was the co-chair of the organ, uh, uh, the, uh, or national organization, umbrella organization of persons with disabilities. And Ron uh, was at the repatriation and was very successful in convincing uh, Jean Chrétien, the prime minister, to include specifically persons with disabilities in section 15, which up to that point was not included. So uh, I wanted to say that as a success story. The other thing I want to move on to now is uh, uh, the Accessibility Advisory Board, of which I am a member, uh, very quickly. And I have uh, booklets that I'm going to circulate. But the Accessibility Act was passed in 2017. And uh, Nova Scotia is the third Canadian province to adopt the legislation. I was part of the uh, minister's uh, panel that developed the legislation. Uh, the Act recognizes accessibility as a human right and how, outlines how we will improve accessibility by preventing and removing barriers. It sets a goal of an accessible Nova Scotia by 2030. Uh, and the, the Accessibility Directorate, which is the office staff, is responsible for putting the new line to practice and for addressing issues related to accessibility and disability. The Accessibility Advisory Board makes recommendations to government on accessibility and advises on the development of accessibility standards. The majority of the board members are persons with disabilities. And to end it all, uh, the standards development, uh, it says we will develop and implement accessibility standards to prevent and remove barriers for persons with disabilities in the f these areas, built environment, education, employment, goods and services, information and communication, public transportation, and transportation infrastructure. And so far, uh, standards for built environment and for education have already been completed. And my understanding is that the municipality, all municipalities in the province, I think there's about 49 of them, are required by law to uh, set up a, an accessibility advisory committee and uh, they're required by law to put together uh, an accessibility plan. How much do I have left? That's it, I guess. 25 seconds. OK. Uh, so uh, uh, there was an ad in the paper, uh, I think it was last Saturday, uh, looking for members to, uh, uh, to sit on the committee. And I want to really thank Wayne and Kathy uh, staff. And are you Ray? Campbell, no, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I thought, anyway, and Ray Campbell, uh, Kathy and all of the staff at, at uh, uh, Handy Trans, that's a valuable service, it really is, and, and I know that probably a lot of you people here have relatives and or friends that have used it, including Wayne, <laughs> not have, you, but a relative, <laughs> and thank you very much for allowing me to update new members and to refresh those that have already been here. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, Councillor Cyril McDonald. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, thank you, Marcy, for sharing this information. And uh, as you know, I have an extensive background working with people, with persons with disabilities uh, from work and volunteer. Uh, so all of this information is, is just a, a breath of fresh air to hear all of the good work that's being done in our municipality. But one thing that stands out for me, and this comes to a, a conversation you and I have had previous, uh, and you touched on it tonight, that Handy Trans should be, is 
uh, should be measured by the number of trips and not the kilometers, as, or vice versa, Marcy. What was the first thing you said? So, so the, the service should not be measured by the number of trips, but instead by the number of kilometers yes. traveled. So yes, we, that's it, right. So yeah. if we look at our regular transit, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, it's right. a direct route and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, but when you talk about going to Gabarus or going to uh, Eskasoni or going to Manadu or wherever that is, uh, that's a that's a, a you know a 45 minute drive perhaps in one direction. Uh, so although it may look like they've only picked up one person that day, that perhaps took them two hours. So I, I think that's an important thing that that we all need to recognize and remember. And the reality is there are a lot of people that use this service. Uh, and when we're we're looking at uh, transportation and saying that we have an accessible municipality, I think Handy Trans is uh, you know forefront in that and continuing to provide the service for the persons that, that utilize it. Um, and I know, Marcy, you, you use our Handy Trans service quite regularly, uh, and many of the folks that I worked with rely on this service on a daily basis. So I commend Wayne and his staff for, uh, for everything that he does with the Handy Trans, and, and Marcy, for all of your work. And uh, I hope that we can continue to, uh, to grow this service. Uh, it's not a service that's ever going to shrink uh, to all of my colleagues around the table. This will continue to be a service that we need to provide, and we need to continue to provide more and more as we go forward. So, Marcy, I really thank you for being here tonight and for all this information and uh, all the great work that you do in our community. Just wanted to mention that all, uh, a lot of the uh, clients at the Horizon Achievement Center on a daily basis use the handy trans too. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Thank you, Councillor, and thank you, Marcy. Councillor Steve Gillespie. Thank you, Mayor McDougall and Marcy. Thank you very much for being here. I'd also like to echo um, what my uh, colleague, Cyril McDonald, had indicated. Uh, Kathy Donovan and Wayne McDonald and his team um, have done an incredible job of, of, of maintaining the service that we have. and and, and uh, looking at growth where, where it is needed. Um, and they, they should be commended for that because this is a service, as Cyril McDonald indicated, that is needed and will be growing in the community. Um, Marcy and I ha have a history. We have worked on projects over the last number of decades. And um, you know when it comes to an advocate in this community for persons with disabilities, uh, and uh, when it comes to accessibility, uh, you don't have to turn very far uh, to see the work that you have done in this community uh, and uh, the impact that you have had uh, for people that need the services. So thank you very much. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Erlene McMullen. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Marcy. I'm not going to repeat what's already been said. It's obvious, but I do want to particularly say a thank you for pointing out the great work and the success of the program from where it initiated to where it is and where we all hope to see it go in the future because we are fully aware that that service, if nothing else, has a higher demand than ever, let alone having to worry about you know it dwindling down. And uh, I also would like to just say my appreciation for coming up and mentioning the accessibility and the committee and the call for volunteers. And I'm kind of going to jump on your <laughs> coattails there, Marcy, seeing as I have the opportunity. But as Marcy had mentioned, there is a call for volunteers out to the public. So anyone that's listening that may have any interest at all in the accessibility and as we move forward at the municipality, please, by all means, put in an application, you know, because everybody's experience is extremely important. And uh, I just, I would really like to see a, a strong table of people that are interested in it. And hopefully they have a quarter of the spark that Marcy has there in regard. So thanks again, Marcy. Well, two things. I'm a strong supporter of people with disabilities and their independence, but I'm a strong supporter of Cape Breton and bringing as much money from all these funding programs here. That's a big objective of mine. That's Thank why you. you're our girl, Mercy. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Darren Brookschweiger. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, welcome, Mercy. Thanks for the great presentation, as usual, that you uh, provide us as often <coughs> as you can, and it's, uh, it's great to see you uh, after your recent illness that you finally get over. We had a few conversations from your, from your room. 
<laughs> and uh, I always enjoy our conversations. There have been so many over the years. And as pointed out, we have come a long way from uh, back in the earlier years, in the late 90s. I can, I can say that without a, a doubt, and we're able to spread the service now across CBRM. And as pointed out, a lot of credit is due to uh, the staff and uh, everybody that's been involved. I think your point about an essential service, there's no question it's, a, it's an essential service. In our last conversation, I pointed that out to you. For me, uh, Handy Trans will always be an essential service now in our community. And uh, as pointed out, it's about uh, bringing everybody involved in social activities, uh, personal activities, and of course, recreational. So it's very important that everybody can partake in those activities and uh, we're there full, full tilt and uh, have been now for a long time. But for you, Marcy, personally, um, I do wanna say it's been great. You have been such a great act, uh, advocate for CBRM and not just here, but uh, served on so many committees over the years and uh, for, for disability, you've been involved for so long, Marcy, and I, I wanna say thank you for all your efforts uh, to date. Uh, we'll continue on here, and uh, as I said, um, we can certainly uh, name it someday maybe as an essential service, but as pointed out for me, it's always been uh, a big one. Um, the, uh, the breakup of our budget, um, I haven't really um, talked to Jennifer about this, Campbell, and she's our, she's our, uh, our bean counter, we call her Marcy here at CBRM. She's... She's the one that counts, and I don't know what would be involved in that, Jennifer. Maybe if I could, sure you, Madam Mayor, ask Jennifer if she would uh, maybe uh, talk about that, and I know, Marcy, in our conversation, it was concerns to see exactly where the dollars were going in case there were any cuts, but even I know the essential service part of it, you'd still like to see that done. Uh, Jennifer, I know that there's different staff for each section, I know the gas would have to be separated, the maintenance and all the different things. What would be involved as far as uh, your bookkeeping end to do such a, or take on such a task? Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in and if Director McDonald wants to comment following, I'll open the mic to allow him to do that. Thank you. Um, the easy separation of what is strictly related to handy trans is one thing. But with the service comes a number of shared items, like the building that the facility is used for the maintenance, the staff associated with performing the maintenance, mm -hmm. um, other administrative overheads and whatnot. So while we can, we can certainly separate certain things like gas, because there are separate credit cards for handy trans sure. uh, pur fuel purchases and specific materials and supplies used to service handy trans buses. But the complexity comes with the shared services component of delivering the service. So I'm not sure if Director McDonald has anything else to add to that, but um, that's my preliminary comments on it. Okay. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, all of all of you who have made positive comments about what I've been doing. But if people, and a lot of you are here, who didn't believe me when I approached them, none of that would have happened. Yeah. So I, I, I want to say I want to say thank you. Uh, to everybody. When I wasn't sure I was going to be accepted on the agenda, I always remember, don't have just plan A, have plan B. <laughs> and uh, in fact, the reason I started with that was in the in council chambers a number of years ago. We had a special speaker come in from out of the country. The plane circled around, circled around, and had to go back. Yes. So it was at that point that I said, that's it. I'll always have plan B. Yep. So, so uh, uh, plan B is, is always important. And so I started to individually call up the counselors and everyone was very supportive right as soon as I started to talk to them. Look, we are very supportive of Andy Train. Don't worry about that. So that was very encouraging and I'm glad that, that I subsequently was able to address everybody here. Director McDonald, did you want to add to Jennifer's comments over before? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just briefly, we, we have been tracking um, our budget in transit and handy trans for the last few years with that, uh, with the request in mind. And I think to Jennifer's point, uh, there's many things that are, that can be separated and there's others that are combined. But um, I think there's always been an argument whether or not 
uh, we, we, we either utilize uh, one budget to cover for another or we um, you know, may have to deal with operational issues uh, that take from one uh, or another. We always have hard decisions to make, but I think the, the, I think the past has proven that we have uh, put a strong focus in handy trans and transit over the last number of years, and I expect the council will provide us with the same uh, ability to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, next on our speakers list, we have Councillor Steve Parsons. Thank you, Marcy. As a new councillor, I really appreciate your information tonight and your, your willingness to come and talk to us and educate us, our new, our new folks around the table. Uh, just want to share some information with you that you may not be aware of. Uh, Iskazoni will have its own transit system come this summer with two buses. They've been ordered and they're wheelchair accessible. So that probably will help complement the existing services. So I'm sure I've had some discussions with, uh, with the folks already. So I just want to let you know that, that uh, we're trying to do our part as well for the whole CBRA. Oh, thank you. And maybe I can get uh, some contact information from you. And also the program that I mentioned, the ATAP <coughs> uh, funding uh, that, that Handy Trans accesses every, every year. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Marcy, as always. It's such a pleasure to have you here in Council Chambers, version 2.0. Um, you know, we look to experts uh, in various fields to help us make good decisions and to help us do things better. So to have someone like you with such amazing lived experience is a huge asset to helping us do better. So thank you so much for coming in, Marcy. And I have these, uh, uh, the publication, Access by Design 2030. So uh, will I give them... Yeah, you can just leave them with, with, with our staff here. We'll make sure to circulate okay. them to all council members. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, Marcy. Much, much, much gratitude. Sorry about that, folks. Okay, moving on to planning issues. Item four in our agenda. Uh, we are 4.1 report on public participation program. This is case 1078, Municipal Planning Strategy Amendment to allow a medical clinic at 46 Cottage Road, Sydney. Uh, so we're going to have our planner, Kristen Knutskoff. Uh, oh, you're already there, my bad. <laughs> Present on this issue. Um, as you'll recall, this uh, application was presented just recently at the January 26th meeting. And so tonight I'm going to focus more on the public participation program, um, a couple discussion points, and then the recommendation and steps forward. Um, at the previous meeting held January 26th, um, Council moved to hold a public participation program. And um, given the ongoing pandemic, we elected to carry out a survey, which was available online or by hard copy. Um, we have provided a full copy of that survey for you within attachment C of your agenda package. Um, we received 832 responses to that survey. Um, and I just want to quickly go over where those responses came from. So this map shows the spread, essentially, of survey responses. So we did open it to CBRM as a whole because, of course, this policy change has the potential to impact CBRM as a whole. Um, that being said, we did send out targeted surveys to the uh, surrounding area of Cottage Road where this proposal um, is, is proposed. Um, so what you'll see is that areas outlined in green um, highlights the areas that we mailed the surveys to. And you'll see reference within our paper to the area residents only, and so that would be referencing the um, properties within, within that area. 
the next map shows um, what I would call a, a density map. So it's showing the concentration of where those surveys came from specific to the Sydney area. So this map is showing that we did in fact receive a, higher, a greater concentration of surveys from the immediate neighborhood surrounding 46 Cottage Road. Next I'll move on to the uh, actual survey results. So the first question that we asked was, should medical clinics be permitted in residential neighborhoods? <coughs> and you'll see um, in the graphics on the uh, presentation screen that um, there was a pretty vast difference in the responses when you look at the survey data as a whole versus those area residents only. So 89% of all responses indicated that yes, medical clinics should be permitted in residential neighborhoods. However, when we look to those area residents surrounding 46 Cottage Road, um, only um, 37 or 38 percent um, said yes. Um, within that survey, we also had the opportunity for written comments to elaborate on justification for support or concern. Um, I won't read those to you, but there is a list on page 52 and 53 of your agenda package. I will also quickly highlight that of the people who did write in additional comments, 23% um, of those indicated that they were supportive on the basis of the um, uh, poor state, I guess, of healthcare in, in the province. Uh, in addition to that, 16% of the written comments um, said that they were supportive um, with subject to conditions, so uh, things such as, you know, only as a home-based business, or based on the uh, floor area, like capping the floor area dedicated to the development, um, or maybe even limiting the number of physicians, and so on. Um, the next question I would highlight is the question, should other sales and service uses be permitted in residential neighborhoods? And again, we see a pretty um, diverse uh, response rate when we look at all responses versus the area residents only. Um, so less support for other sales and service uses on the whole. I also just want to touch on a few points about the municipal planning strategy. Um, the purpose of the municipal planning strategy is to act as a community vision which guides development in the CBRM. And one way that it achieves um, that it achieves that goal is um, providing some certainty and a reasonable expectation of what uses might develop in a given area. And that certainty can, in and of itself, um, promote investment and, and stability within neighborhoods and our business communities. I also want to quickly touch on um, some potential impacts if we're going to look at allowing medical clinics in residential neighborhoods or other sales and service uses. Um, the first, of course, being the impact on residential areas. Um, Non-residential uses, of course, might have some adverse impacts, um, such as increases in traffic, um, generating noise, etc. <clears throat> and of course, that may impact the quiet enjoyment of residential properties. Uh, the next impact is we would want to look at, at how this could affect uh, commercial areas and, and businesses. So. If CBRM is going to look at changing policy that would support decentralization of sales and service uses, that could of course result in more businesses leaving our commercial areas, which could um, potentially affect the viability of the businesses that are left behind in those commercial areas. Um, I also want to highlight that um, you'll see this map in attachment F. So taken together, um, we're showing that <coughs> medical clinics are actually currently permitted in approximately 90% of CBRM's land area. And the remaining areas that you see in red where they're not permitted is predominantly our low density residential zones um, and also our watershed protection areas, but predominantly low density residential zones. The third impact I wanna talk about is on um, housing stock and um, affordability. So preventing commercial development in residential areas can actually act to protect the housing stock. 
And policy that might encourage conversion of residential units into other uses would, of course, reduce the supply of dwelling units. And what we've seen is that it, it costs more to um, build new rather than to make use of existing dwelling units. And that added cost of construction can um, reduce the likelihood of new units and new units that would be used for affordable housing. And the final point, I'll just reiterate, we've, we've talked about this previously, the fact that this does have the potential to be a precedence setting application. Um, staff have received um, a couple of inquiries from individuals who have similar asks or asks for other sales and service uses in residential neighborhoods um, who will wait to see the outcome of this before making their ask. Um, so, for the reasons that I'm discussing this evening, this really has the potential to be a fundamental shift for um, residential neighborhoods in CBRM. And for that reason, if council wishes to reevaluate um, residential neighborhoods, how they're functioning, and the uses that should be permitted within them, it's really better suited um, as a part of the comprehensive review. And for that reason, staff are recommending to uphold plan policy. That being said, um, if council does wish to proceed, the next required step would be to hold a public hearing. And prior to setting a date for a public hearing, um, council must first decide how they would like to regulate these developments. Um, in that case, um, staff um, should direct, or sorry, council should direct staff to return with options for consideration and um, should request that the applicant provide a detailed proposal in a detailed site plan and floor plan. That's it for me. Thank you, Madam Planner. Uh, I know that we do have staff on hand to help us through the questions and discussion that will come up. Uh, is there, are there any questions? Councillor Glenn Perouche. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, thank you, Kristen and Karen all the hard work that I know you two did uh, getting this presentation together. When I look at your numbers for the area of residence within the zone, so when you look at the top of page 52 for my colleagues here, it says 500 main buildings within the RHD zone, 336 are single family dwellings, 99 or two units. This is in Cottage Road and surrounding areas. So of those people, 24 people actually chimed in, in around Cottage Road saying, nine saying yes, 15 saying no, and you have the stat of 62% saying no. Is that a fair representation of where the area was if the the whole, the broad spec of this entire thing <clears throat> is not just Sydney, not just Cottage Road, it's Glace Bay, it's New Waterford. So using, using that stat, I find it, uh, I just, I don't know if it's a fair representation, I guess is how I could say it is, is my spin. If you were to take the 832 people that were actually polled in the whole area and to say, I'll look at the first one where it says all responses should a medical clinic be permitted in residential neighborhoods. 718 people said yes, 89 percent, 91 said no. So I just, it's a, it's a little alarming to me being the counselor in that district and I've spoke to people on both sides, yes and no for this uh, proposed development that basically if you have on page on page 60, when you look at that map of the 100 meter square area, 24 people out of a possible 120 residents chimed in. It's safe to say that 75% didn't answer. So I find that alarming when, and I know a lot of my counselors sitting around this table tonight will disagree with, uh, with my results or possibly not. And then I go into some of your concerns where it'll impact affordable housing. Affordable housing is a major issue that we have right now, regardless of where it is. Another concern is disposal of medical records and medical waste. 
to me, that's an easy fix because we have the regional hospital and they take care of all their waste with, uh, with source stove through uh, Sturry cycle. Uh, benefits, more accessible, inclusive, patient-friendly setting, mixed area use, walkability, create a violent, vibrant, healthy communities. So in saying this, colleagues, I, uh, I just, I, I can't agree with staff's recommendation to uphold this policy and I feel that the majority of those who did respond were in favor of this clinic. Like I said, 832 polled, 722 responses, 718 responses saying yes, 91 saying no for one question, 102 saying no for another question. So I'm hoping that uh, my colleagues here tonight that we can if council chooses to proceed to the next step of the amendment process, we recommend staff to pass a motion directing to prepare a series of amendments. I'm hoping between all of us that there's a way that we can accommodate this and maybe make this site specific, if that's the correct terminology going forward, if enough of my colleagues are on board here. And uh, just through you, Mayor, to Kristen, I just have two quick questions. Is it a fair assumption to say that out of the 24 people that did respond, uh, that they could respond, and this goes with the 700 plus that uh, chimed in the other way, was it monitored on the responses or could the same person chime in, say, 100 times, chime in one time? Was it done the way that we did our last election where one person, one vote, or is it just, was it wide open through, uh, through the process? 30 seconds, if you want to ask your second question. That's your sense. That's all right. That's enough. Okay. Um, so we, we did not track IP addresses on online surveys. And of course, if they're paper, there's really no way for us to verify that there weren't duplicates. Um, we did um, go through the data and pull out any that um, had the same name, same address, and that sort of thing. Um, but apart from that, there's really no way for us to verify if there were additional duplicates. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Next on our speakers list, we have Councillor Darren O'Quinn. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I guess where I'm at with this, I'm in a similar uh, line of thinking as, as your Councillor Perouche. I've been contacted by nine or 10 people in District 11 alone who have no bearing on this, and they've, they're all in favor of this. And they think it's something that we should really do to attract more business, like say no to a medical clinic. I think it's something that we could do, and, and, I, and I think that there's more advantage, the benefits outweigh the negatives for sure. And again, like with, with nine or 10 people in Waterford reaching out and saying that they're in favor of this, you only had 15 in the immediate area alone that were against it, and some of them could have been duplicates. I, I really think the numbers maybe are, aren't as clear as you're, you're saying, like, and uh, I think maybe we could look a little further and maybe some of Glenn's other recommendations we should look at doing. I, I really think we should do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Next on our speakers list, we have Councillor Darren Brookschwager. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, first of all, I want to thank staff for the <coughs> excellent detailed report on um, on where we are here. And uh, you're really reading from the book that we have as far as rules and regulations and our bylaws go. And that's really your job to do that. And I thank you for this. Um, like Councillor Perouche, uh, like I've, I guess for me, it's a, it's a hard one for me because I know what communities across this province are doing to try to attract doctors to the area, right? So I'm a little concerned about it for, for that reason. Um, you know, some, some of them are actually paying rent, providing space. They're doing all things because of the shortage of doctors. Um, and I can really understand the response that Councillor Proush pointed out because these people are looking at the need to keep doctors here and not to upset them or, or not to change uh, what they're trying to do. But this here location, I think, is, is one when I looked at it, is, uh, is something, as Councillor Proush pointed out, what he's talking about is spot zoning. And it's something we stopped um, a long time ago. Uh, we have a lot of uh, grandfathered uh, places, as pointed out in your benefits, uh, number four, there are existing medical clinics in uh, residential areas which do not cause a disturbance. 
But that particular location compared to the average uh, residential area as such, it's got a paved parking lot with, what is it, seven or eight cars? I believe it was that could, uh, that could park there. And, uh, you know, as I see this one, it, it, it's, I'm trying to find a way that we could possibly look at this particular area uh, a little different. And there may be other areas in CBRM that would be matching that would have that kind of parking. Now, at the same time, do I want the floodgates to open for businesses in residential zones? Absolutely not. That's, uh, you know, not my intent whatsoever in, in, in bringing this, uh, my opinion to this. But I want to know if, uh, you know, considering the doctors and the shortages and uh, uh, what we've got going on in CBRM. And again, Glenn pointed it out. Look at these, the people that are supporting this, you know, 718 yeses. Uh, should per, uh, medical clinics, clinics be permitted in residential neighborhoods? 718 yes, 91 no. That's a pretty big majority of, uh, of uh, people um, to uh, support this. So it makes me think that we do need to do some kind of a review um, on these here particular roles. And, uh, and I'd be in favor of supporting uh, Councillor Perouche that we do what we can to have a second look here. And, uh, and I think, uh, uh, Councillor Proust, what you're talking about, uh, the next steps there, we'd go to that section, correct? Is what you're advocating? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'd be supporting that if you're moving that, Councillor. Thank you. Next on our speakers list, we have Councillor Cyril McDonald and Council Perush, we can work on the wording of the motion, perhaps. Yeah, I, I was just, I kind of got a little excited. Okay, there. that's okay. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, Count, sorry, Councillor Sarah yeah, McDonald. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll, I'll try not to repeat uh, too, what, too much of what, what's already been said, but uh, just looking at a few of the concerns, uh, I frequent Cottage Road, uh, I, I, whether it's by vehicle or whether it's by foot, um, when I'm in town for a run, and I look at the, in, the first concern is increased traffic, uh, you know, and although there's patients parking off site, pedestrians, cyclists, so on, the increased traffic on Cottage Road is, is almost amusing to me because I would say that's a, a fairly busy road already. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to have an influx of hundreds of patients per day. Uh, we may be talking an increase of 20 to 50 cars per day. It's also on a bus route, which makes it quite appealing for uh, for perhaps seniors uh, that otherwise couldn't get to a doctor's appointment uh, or may have to take a taxi. Uh, when we look at noise, uh, how noisy are patients going to a doctor's office? I'm not sure. Um, we'll change the feel and character or aesthetics of the neighborhood. There's two neighboring businesses, one being a daycare and one being a place where you go and get your nails done, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's a, 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 not to discredit any of these concerns, but uh, more people loitering in the area. Who loiters at a doctor's office? Uh, and business is closed after hours. Again, there are two neighboring businesses that are both closed after hours. Uh, what I'd also like to ask, a couple of questions, uh, one being, so if this were uh, uh, Dr. Frazier were looking to make this uh, an in-home business, that would be okay. So if she lived there and wanted to run her doctor's office out of her basement, we'd be okay with that. Uh, but we're not okay with it uh, for her starting a, a practice in this space. Uh, so that's question one, how that, how that makes sense. I'd just like to sort of rationalize that and wrap my brain around that. Uh, second would be, do you think, uh, I'm not a mathematician, but uh, there's about 54 units within that radius. Uh, many of them have a number of dwellings in them, lots of duplexes. Uh, at least one is a six unit dwelling. Uh, so when Councillor Proust speaks of the 100 plus residents that could have responded, uh, we got 24. So is that a fair representation? Um, and uh, then I guess the other concern, not really a question, is so if we say no to Dr. Uh, Frazier, uh, what's to stop her from uprooting and going somewhere else where it's much easier to start a clinic? 
outside of the CBRM. And to Councillor Brookswagger's point, uh, we're in a, a crunch here to, to recruit doctors and retain doctors. We're making this difficult for Dr. Fraser in a place that uh, it already has a parking lot. So that would, in my opinion, uh, make it, it, it appear that it's, it's, uh, it's already zoned for, for such a nature of a, perhaps not a medical clinic, but it appears that there would be an opportunity for a business there. Uh, so I'm just, um, obviously these aren't my residents, uh, but I have had a number of calls from my residents and from residents outside. Uh, would I be comfortable with a doctor's office in my backyard? Probably. They're all going to be gone by 5 o'clock when I get home from work. So uh, I'm sure there, there's lots of concerns, and Councillor Perouche, uh, I'm sure, is hearing them far more frequently than the rest of us are. You know, we, we dealt with this with a, uh, a storage unit facility. Who wants a storage unit in their backyard? Well, most people don't. But a doctor's office is closed typically at 5 o'clock, maybe even earlier. The number of cars that are coming and going, I, I, I don't see it actually increasing the flow of Cottage Road. It's already a pretty busy road anyway. So uh, if you could answer those couple of questions, that would, uh, that would keep me quiet. For, um, sure. So to answer your first question, it's not permitted as a home business right now. So if Dr. Fraser wanted to establish a home business, she would be before council as she is now. Um, with regards to the representation and the immediate area, the numbers that we gave for the immediate area are in relation to those individuals that gave a civic address. So in, in total in the survey, approximately between 500 and 525 people gave their civic address. So the remaining numbers that we have we don't have civic addresses for them, so we can't map those. We don't know if they were in the immediate area or not, um, so it's difficult to say whether or not that is an accurate representation. Likely there are going to be more numbers in that number. Um, in relation to Ms. Dr. Fraser moving outside of the CBRM, um, in anticipation of next steps, staff have reviewed jurisdictions throughout, the, throughout Nova Scotia. We're not unique in the way in which we treat medical clinics. Um, so there is kind of a vast range, but the way that the CBRM currently deals with medical clinics is not unique to the CBRM. Um, and I do want to touch base on the traffic question or comment. Um, yes, Cottage Road is a busy street. Um, however, the reason we've asked for a floor plan from Dr. Frazier um, is the current access may not be wide enough to have egress and ingress. She may have to put an access off on to Admiralty Court which is currently a cul-de-sac, a dead-end street, it's going to increase traffic potentially on that street. So that's where the concern comes okay. from. Th thanks for the clarity. <clears throat> Much appreciated. Thank you, Councillor, and, and thank you, Planner Neville, for your, your knowledge on this. Uh, next on our speakers list, we have Councillor Steve Gillespie. Thank you, Mayor, thank you, Mayor McDougall, and uh, thank you to the planning staff as well. Um, I'm not in favor of allowing this to proceed any farther. Um, I do not believe commercial should be in with residential. Um, as it's been indicated, 90% of uh, the CBRM has access to commercial businesses. Um, I think leaving 10% for high residential area is enough, and to be honest, it maybe it even could be more. Um, we're talking about doctor's offices. That's not what we're supposed to be talking about here. My understanding is we're talking about commercial businesses and residential areas. The province of Nova Scotia has a very large role to play in, in attracting doctors to this area. Um, I don't know if CBRM has a role of that size, but it definitely has a role. I can tell you that the physicians that I spoke to over the last two weeks say that there is more than enough room commercially for doctor's offices in this area. I can tell you that the commercial operators that I spoke to in over the last two weeks tell me that there is more than enough commercial space for doctors to rent in this area. I can also tell you that I spoke to business owners and property owners in the downtown core who are not terribly thrilled that we would be allowing commercial businesses to set up in residential areas. Commercial businesses should be set up in commercial areas. If doctors can move from their commercial area to a residential area, then so can dentists, then so can lawyers, then so can accounting firms, just to name a few. 
And if you take that out of the downtown cores that we currently have, that could be an economic issue that we're not looking at. It's been indicated from several councillors that I wouldn't mind having a doctor's office next door. Maybe not. But what if the doctor's office next door decided to become a methadone clinic? Would you have a concern then with the amount of people that were coming and going? I can tell you that I wouldn't want that in my community, and I wouldn't want that in my neighborhood. I find that we're getting off the topic here. Does the CBRM have a responsibility to try to attract doctors? Yes. But I can tell you that the doctors that I spoke with all told me that the reason some of the doctors don't stay here is because they sit down and they say, I want to live in this part of the community. How much are my taxes going to be? That, according to the physicians I spoke to, is the number one reason why they don't stay. The taxes are too high on their homes, depending on the area that they want to live. So when we start talking about why we need what we have to do to try to attract physicians, I think that we're making a mistake in saying that they should set up anywhere they want. As Councillor Brooksreiger indicated, we don't do spot zoning, and we don't do that for a reason. This is not just about doctor's offices. This is about commercial businesses setting up in residential areas. And of the 700 or 800 people that wanted to have this conversation, I bet you they would not want that, a, a commercial business across the street from them. I have a concern when it comes to the number of people that have participated in this that live outside the CBRM. And if you notice on that spot map, some of those were West Mountain, Sydney River, and Cox Heath, because I sent this out and I wanted people to participate. When they got back to me and asked me my questions, they were okay with the doctor's office. They were not okay with any other type of business. I would not want to see commercial businesses set up in the residential areas that we currently have. And I think we're getting off topic here. And I am concerned because a doctor's office can change from an office to a clinic. And then a clinic can change from treating patients to then other types of patients. And I will caution the individuals who want to proceed here, and I just don't think seconds. we're talking about the right thing. So I'm not in favor of this, and if, uh, if a motion is needed, I would motion we accept the recommendation from our planning department. There's a Thank you. motion moved by Councillor Gillespie. Is there a seconder? Second. Seconded by Councillor Lauren Green. Um, discussion on the motion. So I do have a speaker's list. Mm -hmm. uh, just once, I do have a speaker's list. Um, Councillor Eldon McDonald, did you want to speak to the motion that's on the floor? Okay. Point of privilege, Madam Mayor, could you repeat the motion, please? So the motion was to uphold the current policy, correct? Correct. So that for clarity, that policy does not allow for the medical clinic to be established in the residential area. As recommended. As recommended by staff, yes. Uh, Councillor Elder McDonald. Oh. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Thanks very, uh, thanks very much, Madam Mayor. Um, much discussion has been had, and, and it's a difficult, uh, difficult uh, topic. Um, and I appreciate the comments from Councillor Gillespie and understand his concerns as, as well as the other councillors. Um, my position was I was prepared to support a motion, uh, I think, that uh, Councillor Proust was looking to put forward to move the next steps. I think it gives us an opportunity to learn more and be educated more on how possibly we may be able to do this or may not be able to do this. But I think the more information gathering we can have to try to support uh, people as best we can to move forward, I think is an opportunity for us to be educated more and make that final decision on whether we're supporting it or not. So I would be, I would be voting against the current motion uh, based on the grounds of wanting to gather more information and to be as educated as I can be into making uh, a, an appropriate decision on behalf of my residents, uh, but understand both sides of it. Um, I guess for me, this really is about, for me, 
the wider planning strategy. This, this is where this belongs. And this is why, in my opinion, the discussion is going the way it's going. Um, there's a lot to this that a lot of residents would say, yeah, I, I don't mind a doctor's office in my neighborhood. But again, a doctor's office, most people will probably think is family practice, and they don't have a problem with that. But as Councillor Gillespie mentioned, would that same group of people say, I'm OK with methadone clinics and treatment clinics and rehabs? You know, those are under the medical clinic uh, umbrella, I'll say. So that bigger discussion maybe needs to be happening under the wider review of our whole planning strategy of the whole municipality. And that's where this belongs. But unfortunately, this, I don't think, is fair to say, well, it's going to take two years to complete that, and Margaret Fraser is going to have to wait two years for an answer. That just isn't fair. So unfortunately, we're going to have to make a decision one way or another. And I think we, we need to try to work to be educated as much as we can to have the appropriate information uh, to be able to see if we can do this. The other, I think, opportunity I look at also is that, you know, if we do this, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll do this through you, Madam Mayor, to uh, either uh, both planners that are presenting or, or Director Roos, um, is there an opportunity that, you know, we have to make a decision on this as, as this moves forward to next steps, if, if that's the way it goes? Uh, and that still can be looked at in the broader strategy. And let's just use the example that if, if, if in the future this was to go forward and it was approved by council and, and, and the doctor gets to open up her practice on Cottage Road, there's still a wider planning strategy that that particular issue that happened could still be looked at over the whole municipality. And in two years' time, we may have a different opinion of that and we'll have a little bit of feedback on how the one on Cottage Road went and what that looks like and how the residents are actually feeling about it. But it wouldn't stop us that two years later, we could go and say, okay, yes, two years ago we did this for Dr. Frazier, but we're not gonna continue to do this because of what we've learned over the last two years through public consultation and going across through the whole review. Is that not an option that would be available to us? Thanks to your question, Councillor. Um, yes, as, as you've noted, the uh, planning strategy review is underway and we'll actually have the consulting team uh, to introduce themselves to Council shortly and provide kind of an overview of the project moving forward. Um, I guess, as I framed it from the beginning, the idea with this planning stra strategy review is that it's a comprehensive review. So we would take a look at, uh, well, right now the consultant team is working on a growth management uh, plan, identifying uh, you know where uh, some of those commercial areas should be located, or even you know the demand for commercial area moving forward. And just one factor that they'll be considering, uh, but we'll be taking a look at um, all avenues for you know, future development and what that framework looks like. Yeah. So this potentially could in the future go ahead and then council if through consultation with the public decide they don't want to move forward that's an option for us so so i'll, I'll leave it at that i, I will uh, be voting against the the motion that's on the floor based on the grounds of wanting to gather more information so we can see what next steps would like look like and then i'll make my decision based on that further information thank you thank you councillor i'm just going to keep going through the speakers list if, if the speakers who have indicated they want to speak are willing to speak to this motion that's on the floor. Uh, next, Councillor Steve, Par Steve Parsons. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I too, like Councillor Gillespie, looked at this application not in the form of who was asking. Uh, the doctor situation for me is just, it's another application that we've got in terms of our by bylaws and policies. Uh, I guess I was a little bit confused at the start because on page 51, as clearly noted, prior to purchasing the properties, the applicant's real estate agent contacted the planning and development department to inquire about the zoning on the said property. At the time, they were informed the zoning did not, meet, uh, did not permit a medical clinic and that the policy did not support a zone amendment. So I guess for me, the applicant up front knew the situation and what the request was going to be, and all intents and purposes, the challenge is moving forward in terms of making a decision. And that council, at some point in time, may have to break their own rules. And I never want to be accused of non-economic development because that's what I do for a living. Uh, but under the rule books, if we have rules and we're going to break them every time an applicant, depending on whether a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher or whomever, makes an application, and that's the reason why we're going to amend things, I think that's wrong. I think if that's the way we're going to work, take our rule book and throw it out. And I think that's the reason why we're going through a review right now to look at the different opportunities and suggestions of of different variations of what we could have 
as, as municipal uh, bylaws. If you look at page 63, the, doc the letter from the doctor, the purpose of the rezoning is to allow the operation of a medical practice in the building. This will initially be just be my family practice, but in time may also include other clinicians. So that indicates to me that she's wanting to expand to grow her business. That may increase traffic. So for me, I like the, the idea of conditions and what, would, what it could look like, but uh, I, I, will be, I will be supporting the motion put forward by Councillor Gillespie uh, at this time, because if we're gonna have rules, let's stick to them. Yes, there's, there's anomalies to all rules, but in perspective of what we're trying to do in our own review, I think knowing those conditions first uh, would be certainly prudent of council before they make that decision. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Next on our speakers list, Deputy Mayor Erlene McMullen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, uh, okay. In the line of rules, I just want to touch base on the fact that if every rule that was written by the CBRM was completely followed to the letter, there would not be a need for any one of the members around this table. With development comes change, with just people moving forward in time and technology causes change. The old views of certain neighborhoods versus certain development districts, they do change, so that, that I believe is why it's here. We have previously had other requests for things such as areas that, what's a recent example? Two units in, in a development is the max. We've had people come and ask, can we do three? We have, because of fit in the area. And that's not a comparison to what's going on here. I'm just saying in general. When this first came forward, one of the questions that were asked was, could this be specific? to medical clinics. And I've heard commercial versus residential, commercial versus residential. They are not selling bottles of wine. They are not selling hair elastics. They are not selling trinkets. It's a medical clinic. I also have the opportunity and privilege to sit as chair of the community health board. One of our immediate goals is to make sure that healthcare is accessible. And that doesn't mean that the doctors are physically here in a commercial district. What it means is the people that live in the community can actually get there, that have access, that are comfortable. There is negative towards it, I get it. There's also positive. I have one in my district right now, <coughs> watching t intently to see how this goes through. Well, if this person moves, the area she wants to move to is fantastic in my mind. It's mental health related, that's great. It's an old home that has been vacant for years that would help the neighborhood. But again, it's a different type of neighborhood and it's not it's apples and oranges to this, but just, just to put it out there. I don't agree with the idea of commercial moving in, commercial like opening it up to all commercial to move into residential. I don't, I never will. But I am not opposed to a medical clinic being defined, whatever it is, and we as the CBRM, we do, as council and staff, have the ability to decide what the parameters are of the businesses we do allow, or clinics, or medical, whatever it is, whether it's dentists, whether it's psychiatrists. For example, um, um, motor vehicle repair. Every single time we've tried to bring it through, the public comes in overwhelmingly, nope, don't want it, don't care where you live, it didn't matter if you were in the neighborhood or outside of it, overwhelmingly, every time, it was a no. I'm a little skipped ahead, but I meant to thank you ladies and your staff for seven, 800 people is a very great response, especially in past things that we've reached out. To have the vast majority come back and say, and I, as a councillor in District 2, I've also gotten the calls and the support for it. No one has called me yet and said, oh no, we don't want anything to do with it. Everything has been supportive. So my job as a councillor is to further explore that. I'm going to, we do know when people ask that they know the rules, like I said but there's nothing that doesn't state that they can't ask for amendment to the rules, and that's a right our residents should always have. The day that we come as a municipality and say, if it's not in the book, don't even bring it to us, we are in a very, very sad state. And something else that I'm going to address, 
as I wring my hands so very tightly and I'm offering a personal apology to very close friends of mine and people that I respect in the community that when we've mentioned, when colleagues have mentioned, it's okay to have a medical clinic perhaps, but we don't want a methadone clinic. Well, I appreciate your privilege to never have to be exposed to that or live in a close area. Every single pharmacy you see is a methadone or suboxone clinic. People that you see walk down the road that you don't know go there, go there. And I will tell you, because I've gone, I've brought my own child there. And there's no, in my backyard, how many times have we heard the crisis of drugs and rehab in our area? What is our goal but to save our young people and try and make people healthy? The day we as a council sit around and number one say, the rules are the rules we won't budge, or number two, we'll decide what people and what illnesses we do decide to allow? You'll have to forgive me because my hands are shaking because I took that very, very personally. I know people that have done this. I know people that recover. I live in a neighborhood. I'm not privileged to live in, a, in, in an expensive subdivision. I live on Pepit Street in North Sydney. I live in a very low income area. I see this every day. And the fact that that comment was even made at our table enrages me. And I apologize. On behalf of myself, not anyone else, but I apologize. And to those out there that work with this marginalized group of people, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, we'll now move to Councillor Gordon McDonald. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, first of all, I'd like to echo what uh, Councillor Early McMullen said. Uh, for uh, uh, senior council members to sit around here and stereotype individuals that would go to a methadone clinic as other types of patients, they're just patients. Uh, a methadone clinic not in my backyard. Well, they are just people that need medical help and assistance. So I want, I want to echo it as, uh, as strong as uh, Councillor McMullen has echoed it, but I can just tell you, I too would like to apologize for those people out there that, that may be uh, uh, struggling with those problems. Uh, methadone people take a methadone are no different than alcoholics needing treatment or uh, gamblers needing treatment or uh, diabetics needing insulin, uh, they need medical treatment, so um, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I'd like to thank staff for this very uh, extensive report, and uh, here's my, some of my thoughts around it. I, I, I did notice that prior to the purchasing that this was made, there was a real estate agent contact at the planning as well, um, and I kind of was wondering, like, how often does that happen? Does people come to CBRM knowing that the, the, the what the, what the, uh, um, municipal plan of strategy is and try and, and go ahead to do projects that uh, are going to take these kind of uh, resources to get the, the change. Um, I too would like to say that this is not a med about a medical clinic for me. Um, I, I've been supporting uh, uh, doctors and uh, doctor recruitment and hospitals and medical stuff for now for the last number of years and I've been very strong advocate of those, those processes and procedures. Um, so for me, this is not about a medical clinic. What concerns me about this, and not only concerns me about it, is sure, you can put a medical cl clinic anywhere in my backyard, but this is not about a medical clinic. This is about what else is gonna happen should we allow a medical clinic, or in that capacity, is it gonna be a pool hall, right? Is it gonna be, uh, maybe somebody's gonna set up, maybe, maybe the, the province will, change the bylaws to allow cannabis being sold in the private sector. All right, so it's gonna be like a cannabis shop because you can allow retail, from what I understand, in some of this, in some of the, if we were to go ahead with uh, changing some of these, uh, um, these, these strategies. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, there was another opportunity, there was another um, doctor on the north side uh, on Shore Road in Sydney Mines uh, at one time looking to open a medical clinic as well as a home-based medical clinic, and that was denied by council back in 2003. <clears throat> um, sure, I understand the, red, the area. I was up to look at the area as well. It, it's, it, it's an area that probably would suit a medical clinic. Um, but what's the effect for the other communities? That, that Because this is not about uh, the medical clinic on Cotty Trow. This is about the residential heritage de de uh, designation that this area has and how that, how that we, us changing the, the, 
the strategy so that we allow these kind of developments in these kind of residential areas, how is that going to affect the rest of the CBRM and the few, the 10 percent of the areas that we have designated for the uh, residential areas? Um, so, and I don't, and, and throughout this report, I didn't see any what other types of businesses that would be allowed if a medical clin clinic uh, were approved in the RHG area. Um, and I kind of wonder, and, and, and it's, I, I guess it kind of leans toward, towards Councillor Pruch's uh, um, ask is, is, can we make this specific only to a medical clinic? Is there ways to, for the municipality to, I, I suppose, you can do anything if you have the will to do it, I guess, as we were pointed out to earlier this evening. But, you know, like, how, 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 much, how much cause would this cause be to be able to designate it as a medical clinic? Because, yes, people will call me and say, listen, why would you vote against a medical clinic? Why are you even debating it? But again, I don't believe this is about a doctor's medical clinic. It's about development in a residential area. So for me, it would have to be, if, if it could absolutely be, designated as a medical clinic and medical clinic only, I could support moving further. But if it can't be determined that we can only designate this as a medical clinic designation, I, I'm afraid I'd have to go with uh, what Councillor Gillespie's motion is. Thanks. It, are we able to get clarity? Is there a possibility to solely focus on the medical sure clinic. Um, so really it's going to be up to council's discretion it is their it is their policy currently the policy says that sales and service uses are not permitted in urban residential neighborhoods this is not a residential use therefore it falls into that category so at the end of the day how that policy <coughs> changes it is council's policy they they provide us with direction. Um, Kristen and I have, in anticipation of potentially moving forward, um, looked at a range of options to present to council. Um, as it sounds now, I think we have seven or eight different options for council's consideration. So there's, there's a lot of debate that potentially could happen moving forward depending on the direction of council. Um, it, it can range to permitting medical clinics as of right permitting a range of uses as of right, going all the way up to making these uses subject to a development agreement or a zone amendment. So there's there's quite a range of options before council. Uh, it is your policy. You do have the option to make that change. The current wording says that non-residential uses are not to be permitted in urban residential neighborhoods and they're not eligible for a zone amendment. So what is before council is to change that policy to give direction to either open up urban residential neighborhoods to a wide range of uses or open it up specifically to medical clinics and how you do that will depend on the direction you give staff again it can be as of right to um, site plan approval subject to standards zone amendment development agreement there's there is a range before council for their consideration um, and like i said we have about eight potential options if if we're given the direction to move forward Thank you for the clarity on that. Uh, moving forward with the speaker's list, Councillor James Edwards. Thank you, Mayor McDougall. The, uh, the debate here has been uh, uh, fascinating and, uh, um, you know, the, the, the range of uh, uh, opinion and, uh, and emotion, it's, it, it's just uh, fantastic. It's just a, a real healthy debate and uh, I'm enjoying it thoroughly. Um, but w when this uh, uh, first came to uh, council, uh, my position was that uh, we have to give this every consideration. Uh, we're talking about a, a doctor's office uh, uh, during a, a pandemic. And um, so, you know, we wanted to leave no stone unturned. And uh, a lot of what I, a lot of notes that I had uh, uh, made to myself here. It's already been captured uh, around the uh, table here, so I, I won't do that, but um, uh, again, uh, I wanted to have uh, every consideration uh, and, and uh, to uh, go forward with this, and I'm, I'm not there, uh, so uh, I, I wouldn't be uh, um, uh, supporting uh, Councillor Gillespie's uh, motion on that. Uh, uh, I, I would like to have more information. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Glenn Perouche, so this is a new motion, so you have five minutes. 
Yeah, I just, quick, quick little chat. When I finished up the first time, I was referring to uh, what in my, <laughs> how I was looking at it, the second recommendation that staff was making with the uh, with council to pass a motion requesting the applicant submit the detail, detailed floor plan and whatnot, but we'll, uh, that that was that's where I was intended when you mentioned to clarify my uh, my motion. But since since then things have uh, things have gotten pretty heated, and I just I just want to agree with Erlene and uh, and Gordon that the premise behind a medical clinic is to help people. Sorry, uh, the premise is to help people. We're here to help people. We're advocates. So whether it's a medical clinic. That's that's my main concern. I I'm, I don't want uh, I don't want any other type development going on, right? I think I think how it's worded. Maybe we could change some of the wording if we can. If council agrees to go forward and to go with uh, Kristen and Karen's eight recommendations that we can have, that's that's the end result. I think that's what we should be doing. We gotta we gotta push this as far as we want. We all talked about change. Change is in the air. Let's take it a step further and see where it takes us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next on our speakers list, on your first opportunity, Councillor Lauren Green. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with Council. I move this, uh, second this motion to get it on the floor so we can actually have this debate. Um, <coughs> but Karen, I appreciate your comments when you say to Council that this is our document we make the decisions, I appreciate that. Um, if we wish to change things, uh, everyone the, around this table, we have the opportunity to change those things. But understand when you change things that you're sending staff in a different direction, they're already working on a plan for us because we put it forward. And now if we wanna stop them in midstream, then we're gonna have others that are gonna come after them. Um, so I think we wanna be careful what we, what we set here. Maybe perhaps this is not where you want to be in terms of, no, let's just stop it and squash it. I understand that. But we want to be extremely careful not to set a false precedent for the developers out there. And I think that that's the key word. We're talking developers. Let's get out of the, the issue of what's actually going there. Because as Gordon said, as Steve said, Steve said the rule books. Are we going to change the rule books? Gordon said, are we going to set up pool halls? That's what we need to be really specific about. We're changing the the planning strategy for that particular area. So that particular area will open up the gates for someone else to come to the, the door. And how do you say no to the next person that comes, whether it's a doctor, whether it's a lawyer, whether it's a candy store? How do you change those once you open a door and you decide to let this happen? So I think for council, I know for me, Karen, once again, I appreciate that this is our document. If we want to change it, we can change it. We can. That's our book. We want to change the book, we can. But understand, changing it now opens the door for others to come, and how do you refu refuse someone else for whatever venture they have in mind for a residential area? So I say be very careful for what you're doing here this evening because it's a plan that's been, before I sat at this table, it's a plan that's been in place. We've got a planning committee, a planning department that has been working on this for years. And I think we, we owe it to the, our planning department to at least see this plan that they're putting together to fruition for this council. And at the end of the day, if you want to change it, we can change it. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next, on your second opportunity, Councillor Steve Gillespie. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor McDougall. Um, obviously, I have a history of saying stupid stuff. That goes without saying. Um, but uh, I was not trying to offend anyone. I was only trying to point out that there are different levels of medical uh, clinics and that we all seem to be just focusing on the one, which is a family practice. Um, I know family practices that work well beyond 5 p.m., 8, 9, 10, 11 o'clock, depending on when the patients are available. Uh, I, I, too, have been to um, a methadone clinic with a loved one, and I understand that that is, a, that is a concern. What I was trying to say was there there would be more traffic regarding a different clinic, 
and I used methadone only because I have a, I, I know the difference between the two and I've been involved in the two and it's never my intent to offend anybody. So please accept my apologies, okay? And if you wanna punch me, feel free. I, I haven't yet, so you're good. I know, I have yes, you haven't yet. Um, but again, it comes, it, for me, it just comes back to the greater conversation that I would be okay with a medical clinic in residential areas. I would, I'd be okay with that because they would serve a purpose and they would be part of the larger picture of how the CBRM can help recruit and keep doctors. But that is only one part of it. There is a larger conversation to have here, and as Councillor Perouche has indicated, maybe it is better for us to defeat the motion as it stands, but maybe to come back and say, as part of the municipal planning strategy, we need to look at what we can do to make it better. It's time. Okay, thank you. Councillor Darren Brookschwager. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I think uh, what we've been through here, I think uh, staff got the idea of what we're talking about and what we're interested in. We're not interested in candy stores with the amendment. Mm -hmm. I think they can do some pretty excellent work based on what they've heard here this evening. I think maybe even lot discussion has to take place, the size of lot that's currently at that location. There's lots of things we can do to change the amendment that you don't have to have a pool hall or, or stores. Staff heard the general conversation. They can design this or they can try to. And I think we have the opportunity as counselors, we can send off emails with further comments that may help in the design of this. And I think that should be uh, suffice. So if the motion's on the floor, I'll be voting to defeat that motion. And I'll go back and I'm sure uh, what Councillor Proust was talking about was the last paragraph, as I read it, Madam Mayor, prepare the, and present a series of amendment options for Council. And that was the last paragraph in page uh, 54. But I, too, enjoyed the conversation, but I think staff really heard where we are as a Council. Now, if they can do something to help us with this, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any further discussion on the motion? Question. Oh. Point of privilege. Okay. Okay. Um, the motion was to accept the recommendation from our planning department. To uphold the current policy, uh, and which would ultimately not allow for the clinic to, to be established, yes. Okay. Can I ask for clarification from our planning department on what the next steps would be if the motion that I made was defeated. We can have dis, oh sorry, go ahead. Um, okay, so just to clarify. <clears throat> so if the motion that you have before council is defeated, um, uh, my interpretation would be that council would have to make a subsequent motion to deal exactly. with the application. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? And I can I can clarify again. So the motion currently is to uphold the current policy, which would ultimately not allow the clinic to be established. It was moved by Councillor Gillespie, seconded by Councillor Lauren Green. Any further discussion on this motion? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Against, nay. Nay. Okay, there is a difference, so we will go around the table. <laughs> Councillor Gordon McDonald. Nay. Deputy Mayor Erlene McMullen. Nay. Councillor Cyril McDonald. Nay. Councillor Steve Gillespie. Yes. Councillor Eldon McDonald. Nay. Councillor Glenn Perouche. Nay. Councillor Steve Parsons. <coughs> nay. Councillor James Edwards. Nay. Councillor Ken Tracy. Nay. Councillor Darren Brookschweiger. Nay. Councillor Darren O'Quinn. Nay. Councillor Lauren Green. Nay. Motion has been defeated. Councillor Glenn Perouche. 
Is this when I make the motion? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> For the love of God, yes. You have the floor, Counselor. Every time something in District 6 comes to this table, it turns into a very, very lengthy, lengthy conversation. So I would like to direct staff to pass a motion requ requesting the applicant submit a detailed floor plan, site plan, drawn to scale in compliance with the requirements of the land use bylaw and a description of their development proposal to be used in the drafting of amending bylaws for council's consideration. Second. Question. Oh. Question, clarification. Yeah, so ahead. Uh, Go ahead, Councilor Steve Parsons. Sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, that's specifically on a floor plan versus, I thought we were talking about what types of businesses. That yeah. would certainly make reference to more than floor plans. So for clarity, there is a, there is a pre, there is wording within the recommendation. So we could uh, craft the motion to say we would like to move forward with the public hearing or not, not, oh, go ahead. So the, the recommendation that's in the issue paper as the second option for council is to pass a motion to direct staff to prepare a series of amendment options for council's consideration prior to scheduling the public hearing. Okay. And yes. as well, we would like that council pass a motion directing the applicant, as you indicated, to provide their, their building plans, their site plan, and a, and a detail of their, of their proposal so that when we're drafting amending bylaws, we can make sure that at the end of the day, we don't want to put something before council, council will pass it. And then when they come for the building development permit, they're not meeting those requirements. So we want to make sure that we're seeing the details so that when we're drafting those uh, amendment options for council that the applicant will be able to meet those. Madam Clerk, for clarity, would we require one or two motions there because there's two different pieces? Um, it's up to you. Um, it can be in one motion. Okay, just for clarity. So basically that last paragraph, Council Clerk Proust, you can. <laughs> what she said. <laughs> what Katie what she said, <laughs> she's a lot smarter than I. No, you're doing a great job. I move it as the last paragraph. Is that how it should be worded? Perfect. Then? <laughs> Thank you. Is there a seconder? Second. Oh, is there a second? oh seconded by Councillor Cyril McDonald. Any discussion on the mo motion? Madam Mayor, if I, if oh, I may. Sorry, just, sorry. Just for clarification, because the, um, if you look at that paragraph, it says the, uh, the site plan draw, the, the site plan drawings to scale in compliance with the requirements of the land use bylaw currently exists so I mean if we say that obviously the current bylaw Doesn't. does not does not allow it so do we right. allow that in there yes yeah, so we're making in reference to yeah. the other development standards that they have to comply okay. with so parking right. access okay. not the use itself okay good eyes though counselor yeah oh any other further discussion or questions Question. oh sorry it's really sorry. tough to scan the room my apologies oh. Councillor Eldon McDonald Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. I guess it's it's somewhat, uh, I guess, on the motion, but um, I support going forward with the recommendation as, as presented in the issue paper here for the uh, second option. But I also would like to uh, restate that um, I would like uh, Director Roos to keep this on the agenda for our full review so that doesn't get missed. So I would request that to be part of specific to uh, the review going over the next year or however long it's going to take. So thank you. I'll add it to the to-do list for the end of the evening. Uh, any further discussion? And thank you to staff. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Looking for the question? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Contrary, nay. Motion is carried. Uh, thank you, Council, for really good, meaningful discussion. I, I do want to make one quick point about the power of language and privilege within their council chambers. Um, you know, this, is, this has been a good test and a good example of the way that we say things um, can impact <coughs> other people. So I know I have a list of, of meetings and workshops that we're going to review shortly here on work that we're doing going forward, but I do want to reiterate the importance of perhaps bringing some training into our council. I know I've been speaking with um, folks like Veronica Merrifield about diversity and sensitivity training um, just to help us understand our language and, and, and how to use it um, 
in the kindest and most meaningful way possible, but also perhaps bringing more folks in again, like the Ally Center, to keep helping us understand what the what these issues in our community really are, uh, and how we can be mindful of those issues when we're in this room and making decisions. Um, my apologies. Thank you again to staff for all of your. Oh, they're gone. Hard work and. Uh, they're gone. <laughs> I don't blame them. <laughs> they got out of here. But thank you. <laughs> Next item on our agenda, number item five, business arising. So 5.1 is council meeting from February 23rd, 2021. Uh, public report, citizen appointments to various committees. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my memo can be found on page 69 of the council agenda package. And this is just in follow-up to our February 23rd council meeting uh, where we discussed the citizen appointments. And um, so now I'm pleased to advise that all successful applicants have accepted the positions and um, on the various committees and the required background checks are complete and in order. So I want to provide council with a public report on the names of the citizens appointed by council um, as, um, and I'm going to read them into the record. So for the police commission for the two-year term, for North Division is Lloyd Bailey, for Central Division is Helen Lodi, <coughs> excuse me, and for the East Division is Dale Deering Burt. On our Audit Committee for a two-year term is Mark Galley. And on the Heritage Committee for a two-year term again, Thomas Ashford, Eric McDonald Keyes, Allie McGinnis, Saul McNeil, and Spiro Triffis. For the Cape Breton Regional Library Board, again for a two-year term, Ron McDonald and Douglas McLennan. On the Port of Sydney Development Corporation, these are for a three-year term. Um, first are the individuals with business and commerce expertise is Greg Delaney and Peter Gillis. And the individual licensed to practice law is Dan McDonald. On the Diversity Committee, these are um, identified by stakeholder groups and they're for two-year term as well. The representative for the African Nova Scotia community is Andrea Holly. And for the disability community is Jenny <coughs> Rachel Lind. And the mental health community is Keith Anderson. The First Nations community is Jennifer Jesty. The representative for the newcomer community, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this properly, is Hind Ilukul. The women's group community representative is Ann McPhee. And our three representatives for members at large, community members at large, are Mary Susan Burke, Susan McDonald, and Amanda Seymour Skinner. I would note that we didn't receive um, applications for three sectors within uh, the diversity committee. That would be the gay, lesbian, and transgender community, Cape Breton University, and the Cape Breton Victoria Regional Center for Education. Uh, those positions have been re-advertised, and um, that, that will close this Friday, March 26th, and I will be bringing a report to the nominating committee on that. I'd also point out that back in January of 2020, just before COVID, uh, there were citizens appointed by council to the Port of Sydney Development Corporation Board, and their names, but their names were never publicly released. So I just wanted to provide those publicly as well. So an in, the individual with the professional engineering de designation is Troy Hulme. Individual with the professional accounting designation is Sylvie Gerbasi. And the individual with expertise in business and commerce is James Kerr. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, and thank you to the nominating committee as well. It was, it was a process. It was a lot. Um, also, thank you to the public for your genuine interest. Uh, I've never seen so many, in my short time on council, so many applications come in. It was really encouraging to see how many people want to be actively engaged in, in, in the municipal um, world of government. So thank you to everybody, specifically to our clerk and staff for really just being crazy organized and making it as easy as possible for the nominating committee. Uh, now we can move forward with item seven, financial statements. Um, I will ask our chief financial officer, Jennifer Campbell, uh, to go through our J January 31st, 2020 um, statements, or not go through, respond to any questions regarding the statements. <laughs> For information purposes, right? Yep, yeah. yep, no voting. Councillor Steve Parsons. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. 
Uh, I don't have a specific question about the finances as reported, but I do in terms of upcoming budget talks. Uh, recently, we've asked for overtime reports by department uh, for the last three or four years, which we've got as council. Uh, in preparation for these uh, meetings coming up, of course, where wages and benefits, the whole gamut, will be discussed in terms of our budget. If it would be through you to the CAO, mm -hmm. if we could, as, as a preempt, ask the directors to give some sort of history in terms of overtime in the departments to give us new folks an understanding of how we incur overtime uh, to, the, to the point that it is what it is. And in terms of going forward, it uh, can certainly be a healthy debate when we have those uh, budget talks. Thank you. Excellent point, Councillor. Any further questions regarding the financial statements for CBRM? Seeing none, we can go to item 7.2, Port of Sydney Development Corporation, financial report up to January 31st, 2021. Any questions? Seeing none, we will move to item eight. Just uh, a review of our upcoming meeting. So there's quite a bit going on, uh, including as Councillor Steve Parsons mentioned, our budget process. Uh, <coughs> just to let everybody in the viewing audience know as well, Friday, March 26 at 1.30 p.m., there will be a council workshop with Engage Nova Scotia regarding the quality of life survey. Uh, that will be held here in the Centre 200 concourse. Uh, Danny Graham will be guiding us through a really in-depth look at the results of that survey specific to the CBRM but also comparing it to the results from the rest of the province as well. So again, really helpful information uh, when we're making decisions here regarding um, programming and supports for our residents. Monday, March 29th at 2 p.m. is the Board of Police Commissioners. That will actually be held in council chambers because we have so few people that we can um, socially distance. So for those on that committee, it'll be nice to be back in council chambers. Uh, Tuesday, March 30th at 9.30 a.m., there is a council meeting regarding the committee meeting structure and schedule. So that is when we are going to sit as a council and decide what our meeting schedule is going to look like for the next three and a half years, more or less. Um, if you have ideas or if you have a schedule that you think would work, I would encourage you to submit that beforehand. If not, we can we will have a couple of examples we can work from. On Wednesday, March 31st at 9.30 a.m., council meeting regarding Sydney Central Library. So this is an action item coming out of our last council meeting. We will be having all those who are financially um, and contractually obliged to this project participating. And as of today, I also did extend an invitation to Senator Dan Christmas as per Councillor Steve Parsons' Um, request so that meeting and the committee meeting is or the committee structure meeting are going to be held via <coughs> zoom finally Tuesday April 6th and Wednesday April 7th are allocated uh, for budget sessions because there are so many people re in, in re regards to staff and council that are required to be in the same room at the same time, we're going to be holding these meetings at Pittman Hall because we have to separate. So as you can see here, we're now at six foot tables, so we're not, it's not possible that we can actually hold it in this room, much less our council chamber. So we'll be at Pittman Hall at the Joan Harris Cruz Pavilion. Um, any questions regarding that? Councillor Lauren Green. Just in regards to the, uh, um, the one, meeting for the uh, library, it's uh, via Zoom. I'm wondering if that can be held in person. Um, I don't know how many players are gonna be in the room for the library, but because it's such a big issue, I, I'm just wondering if that can be held either here or somewhere else. I'm, I'm not sure how other councillors feel about that, but the Zoom is where it will be a lengthy meeting. Uh, I, I'd like yep. to, if it's, if at all possible, I'd like to sure. have that in person. I don't know how councillors feel around the table about that, yep. but. Just for clarity, we were Zoom. trying to cut down on expenses because every time we meet, it does cost money. So by all means, it, I, I agree. I think when it comes to those heavier discussions, in person is better, as long as council feels comfortable with that. If this place is not available, we can definitely look for <coughs> another venue. Is that okay, Madam Clerk? Sure, we can look into that for sure. I didn't ask permission, I'm sorry. No, I, th I think the original reason for the, the Zoom was we weren't sure the number of participants, and again, we are limited in this room, so yeah. once we determine the number of participants, we can we can determine what facility can accommodate okay. us. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions regarding the upcoming meetings and workshops? It's 
going to be busy. It's going to be great. Um, finally, item nine, just a review of the action items from this meeting. I just like to go over these things just to make sure that we're not missing anything. I'll go very quickly. The first thing was to make sure that there is a letter being sent to the minister regarding the dedication of Highlanders Memorial Way. We're also going to reach out to SEPI and Pituba just to make sure that we have all of the reports and studies that they cited uh, to share amongst council for our information. Um, we also do need to get an update regarding the Lewisburg Gabarus Road from MP Calloway's office, and I did also add in there Alana Pond's office. She seems to be uh, really in on that file. We will um, make sure to add Lewisburg Waterfront uh, project as is being spearheaded by Development Nova Scotia to our list of priorities uh, and also do some research from the municipal level through our own networks regarding what type of potential funding is out there to move that forward project or move that project forward. Um, also just a note to keep issues regarding planning topics such as the medical clinic tonight top of mind while we're going into the municipal planning strategy I know director Ruth is, loves when we have those conversations and is just keeping a notebook right uh, and finally um, set up uh, some sort of diversity training for council I, it just it, it's wonderful education to have and to bring in organizations like the Ally Center perhaps and, and experts like Veronica Merrifield for, for example or Scott uh, Thomas to help us keep on top of that education. Uh, did I miss anything? Is there anything folks had burning in a pocket that I forgot to add? Oh, the, sorry. Steve, the Council Parsons. The overtime request review. My apologies. Overtime request review, and that will be prior to our budget sessions. Thank Excellent. Thank, nope, thank you. This is a good practice, I think, for us to make sure we're all on the same page. Otherwise, any... Any other comments before we adjourn? Seeing none, have a good evening and thank you all.